to to accept the 2021 April 1st Planning and Development Committee agenda, please. Moved uh, Mayor uh, Director McCordoff, seconded uh, uh, Director uh, Robinson. All right, the uh, first agenda and we uh, first item on the agenda and the only item on the agenda is the regional housing needs assessment. We have a delegation, but I'm going to have uh, uh, CAO Newell uh, do an intro on this, please. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So uh, we do have a delegation that's going to present on the housing needs assessment. And I believe uh, to do the introduction on that is going to be our Corey Lebrecht, our planner too, who's uh, managing the project for us. So we'll turn it over to Mr. Lebrecht. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Lebrecht. Good morning, everybody. In 2019, the district of Summerland, City of Penticton, Village of Karameas, and the Regional District resolved to undertake a collaborative regional housing needs report to fulfill the province's new legislative requirements. In 2020, EcoPlan was hired through a provincial grant to complete the project, which included engagement with several housing organizations and extensive data analysis. The report fulfills all of the province's requirements and also includes sections on First Nations and other municipalities in the region. It provides an overview of housing needs in the region and will be an important study to inform future policy discussions and plan reviews. With that, I will introduce John Ingram and Abby Morin from EcoPlan. Uh, thank you, Corey. Good morning, uh, board. I'm John Ingram from EcoPlan, one of the principals here. And we are going to give you just a brief presentation, an overview of the housing assessments report. And I think it's Abby, my colleague, Abby Moran is going to share her screen. So next slide. So we've done a number of presentations leading up to this. Um, Back in February, uh, we had a project working group session. So that was with partnering um, municipalities. Uh, so the District of Summerland, City of Penticton, Village of Caramios, and the RWOS. And we had a presentation with Caramios Council March 15th, Penticton on the 16th, and on the 22nd with Summerland Council, and now today with the RDOS board. So just with a big picture already, the Local Government Act was amended in 2019, and um, there's a requirement brought in for all local governments to complete a housing needs report by April 2022 and every five years thereafter. And they're intended to help local governments in the province better understand and respond to housing needs throughout BC and be able to compare apples to apples across uh, the province. Um, there's three year funding program administered by UBCM, which is where RDOS got funds uh, for this program. And there's also data and guidance provided uh, by the province uh, working with StatsCan and BC Stats. And the image on the bottom just shows the spectrum uh, of housing that the, these reports looked at moving from safety net housing on the left, so emergency shelters, all the way through to uh, market housing on the, the right, and ownership housing. So the purpose of these uh, housing reports is to create a snapshot of the current housing situation, situations uh, to show how house, housing has changed over the past, so going back to the 2006 census year, and to provide estimates on how housing may evolve uh, going forward to the next five year period, so forward to 2026. And they're intended to support future housing work. And they really look at the the what, not the how, meaning that um, they're not housing strategies, they're not providing uh, recommendations, policy recommendations, and the like, they're just providing the information to inform and to help support some of that work at the local government level. So, the real uh, core focus, uh, no pun intended, core focus of uh, these housing reports is to look at core housing needs. And 
uh, court housing is determined by looking at three criteria adequacy does the dwelling require major repairs suitability is the dwelling overcrowded and affordability can a household afford acceptable alternative housing and court housing needs to find housing that falls uh, below one or more of those standards and 30% or more of the poor tax income is uh, spent on that housing. And then extreme core housing need is the same as above, but where 50% of total core tax income uh, is spent. So with that, I'm going to pass over to Evie to do a little bit of a walkthrough, but I did, do just want to point out that um, we did catch one uh, error despite it's, it's a, almost a 200 page document and they went through several rounds of uh, review um, with the, the project team RDOS staff and ourselves but uh, we found a small typo uh, page 131 for electoral area F and uh, we removed that um, that sentence it's in the demographics uh, section but we just wanted to, to point that out and so now I'm going to pass that on to uh, Evie who will give a walkthrough on sort of some of the key highlights at the RDOS level. Okay, so I'm going to just talk about some of the key findings um, that we found through this report across the region and also uh, for the electoral areas and the municipalities. Um, to start, we found that from 2016 to 2026, an estimated 5,934 new units may be required across the region, and that's just to meet basic housing demand. So that's the number of dwellings required to house the anticipated household growth. And this chart is comparing um, the proportion of different housing types needed across the region in electoral areas and municipalities. And you can see that electoral areas are needing a slightly greater proportion of larger homes with three or more bedrooms than just the municipalities. And according to BC Housing's new homes registry, um, the region was actually on track to meet this target of over 5,000 new units. Um, so that suggests that some of the housing needs in the region go beyond simply the provision of dwellings. In 2016, an estimated 4,480 households were in core housing need. That's 12% of all the households in the region. And renter households were much more likely to be in a state of core housing needs than those who owned their home. And 2,000 of those households were in extreme core housing need. Um, and this chart is comparing the proportion of households in core and extreme core housing need across the region in electoral areas and municipalities. And um, you can see in the middle, electoral areas have a slightly smaller proportion of households in core housing need than the municipalities. Um, by talking to stakeholders, we heard that affordable housing was a, a key housing need in the region. Um, and they discussed an acute shortage of um, affordable housing. So this, in 2016, 20% of households across the region were spending more than 30% of their income on shelter costs. And this has remained relatively stable since 2006. This chart is comparing all the average household um, sale values since 2011. Um, the region is shown in the darker black, thicker black line there which exceeded $600,000 in 2020. Um, almost all of these areas have experienced an increase um, in average sale price by over $250,000 since 2011. The highest prices were kind of in the Naramata region and the lowest were in Karameos and Princeton. Um, we also heard that there's an, a shortage of rental availability of all types and sizes. Across the region, around 26% of households were renter households. This was slightly um, lower in electoral areas, around 20% um, than in municipalities. But since 2006, the proportion of renters has generally increased by about 2%. But the construction of new purpose-built rental buildings has lagged. Uh, we also found that renter households tended to be um, more likely to be in a court state of core housing need in part, this is because of um, an increasing income gap between renter and owner households, and also because rental rates have been increasing um, steadily over the past few years. 
BC Housing defines special needs housing as housing for clients who need access to affordable housing with support services, such as adults with mental and or physical disabilities or youth. And um, across the region, Penticton was the main place that provided these types of services. Um, so pe people who need these services may have a difficult time finding them across the region and they may eventually find themselves in Penticton, but even there, um, finding special needs housing was a concern. The regional district has a relatively large population of seniors, provincially around 17% of the population are seniors, but in um, the RDOS, around 30% of the population are seniors and the population is aging at a faster rate than other regional districts in, in the province. Um, so there's already a high demand for seniors housing, and this is anticipated to increase over the next five years. So um, that might mean an increased demand for smaller homes or um, seniors housing or retirement housing. Um, while this population continues to age, there's been relatively limited purpose-built seniors housing um, constructed or registered in the region. Um, although recently a 26 unit facility was developed in Okanagan Falls, and then there's another development being underway in Karameos and also in Penticton. Seniors, particularly those who live alone and rent their dwelling, were also at a high risk of being in a state of core housing need. We also heard that there was a need for housing for families, particularly affordable housing for low to moderate income families and lone parent families. Around 15% of the population was aged 19 or younger and this age cohort isn't anticipated to increase significantly over the next few years. Um, but we heard that this demand exists and isn't anticipated to increase, but still exists. Um, this chart is comparing household size to bedroom size um, or number of bedrooms. You can see that there's actually a lot more um, smaller one person households than there are one bedroom households. But one of the problems, um, housing for families tends to be houses with two or more bedrooms. And one of the key problems here is that they have relatively high average sale prices of over $500,000 or um, high monthly rental costs. So that puts um, housing ownership within reach of families who have incomes that are higher than the median typically. Um, we also found that lone parent households were at the greatest risk of being in a state of core housing need. For example, in Penticton, nearly 40% of the population who were in core housing need were lone parent households. Around 200 people identify as being homeless across the region and mainly there in Penticton. And this number may increase in the warmer summer months. Um, and all of the supports for people experiencing or at risk of homelessness are in Penticton, around 30 shelter beds year round and um, over 40 rent supplements, but that's less than the number of people who identify as being homeless. We also heard that visible homelessness only shows a small percentage of people who are actually experiencing homelessness and that there's varying degrees of also hidden homelessness. So visible homelessness are people who are unsheltered. Um, Whereas hidden homelessness are people who don't have a stable tenure. For example, they might be living on a couch or in a vehicle. And then there's just also people who are at high risk of homelessness um, in part because of increasing um, rental rates and lower incomes. And so we heard that there was a lack of housing supports for people at risk of or experiencing homelessness. Another housing need in the region is housing for agricultural workers. Um, so, as an agricultural center in the province, um, particularly in the summer, people will come to pick crops. And some of these operations will provide housing for these workers, but others do not. And the RDOS does have a campsite for seasonal workers, but it doesn't accommodate all the workers. Um, so, there's some associated challenges with that. One is that these workers might be not be able to secure housing and it might lead to them living in overcrowded situations. Another challenge is that some of these seasonal pickers cabins 
might then be rented out in the winter when they're not needed for the agricultural workers, but they're not actually suitably built to be inhabited during those seasons. And a, a final housing need is uh, related to seasonal vacation homes. So the region is a popular tourist destination um, with the peak rental vacation rental period typically being in July to September. Um, when we looked in 2020, there was 950 whole home rent vacation rentals. So that doesn't include, um, for example, a, a bedroom in someone's home. And half of these were in Penticton. And there can be some associated challenges with vacation rentals um, for residents. One is that there's less housing stability. So some people might be able to um, rent a home outside of the peak period of vacation rentals, but lose it during that July to September period. It also decreases the number of full time rentals available. And similar to gentrification, it can sometimes increase the value of an area. Um, so increasing house and rent prices. So combined fewer, but more expensive year round accommodations can make it harder for local residents to continue living in their communities. So these were just some of the key findings that we uh, found throughout the region. We have large data sets that include uh, a lot more information about the housing needs, but we just wanted to highlight some of the key ones. Thank you, Ms. I'd like to thank folks very much. Uh, just an absolutely interesting study. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time reading through it. I, you've done an outstanding job, so I'm 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 quite impressed with what you've done here. A lot of uh, covered in this. Uh, I definitely like to know if you make the uh, copy electronically available to the members. I think it'll be uh, quite useful going forward. Uh, to that end, I would from the, the board. Director, Director Gettin. I think he's calling on you, Director Gettin. We're having a hard time hearing you, Director Kimono. Go ahead, Director Gettin. Hello? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. To the chair. Um, I just wanted to, if you could please repeat the error that found in 131 regarding air F. I just missed that in the introduction. Oh, sure. It was just um, a small error on page 131 that just uh, referenced um, boundary extensions that have not. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so it, it was just a sentence in the demographic section um, looking that referenced, and we're not sure how it got there, but referenced uh, some boundary. Okay, thank you. If I could ask. D Director Holmes, please. I think we got a delay. Uh, sir, I didn't catch that last answer. I wouldn't mind it. Is it pot? Can anybody hear me? Uh, I can hear you, uh, uh, Director Gettins. Uh, uh, Mr. Ingram, would you like to hear your answer there? Sure. It was on page 131 of 176. It was in the demographic section and it just uh, for electoral area F and it referenced um, to boundary. Extensions that did not uh, happen. I'm not sure how it got there. It was removed. It was a single sentence that didn't have any bearing on any of the data or uh, other information in the section. Did you get that, Gettins? Uh, Director Gettins, that? It, it seems that we lost Director Gettins here. 
Director Gens, I believe you're on mute. All right, moving on. Are there any other questions? We can come back to Director Gens later. Director Coyne, senior. Yeah, I'm just curious of how old the data you were working with um, for these uh, stats that you have there. Most of the data came from uh, the past three census periods, so 2006, 2011, and 2016. I see a hand in the boardroom. I assume that's uh, Director Zakovic. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to clarify a couple um, errors in the electoral area E summary. Uh, the very first paragraph does say that the city of Penticton in area D is to the north of Naramata when it's to the south. And uh, the summary page also indicates that in area E, we don't have any um, special needs housing. So we, we actually do have two four uh, four plexes there. One is Naramata Seniors Housing Society, but the other four plexes through BC Housing, and it is for uh, people with disabilities or seniors. So I just wanted to make that clarification for the summary page. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Zakovich. I see uh, Director Getton's hand up. Do we have you back? Uh, have you got audio? I think so. Chair, can you hear me better now? Yeah. Great. Thank you to the chair. Just following up again on, on the last paragraph on page 131 for area F, it does say that the population fell by almost 28%. And that was what you were saying is the errors that it's attributed to a boundary expansion. But if it's not the boundary expansion, do you know what caused that population drop of 28%? Thank you. Um, no, we don't. And one of the things that we the things that is worth pointing out is that um, there are quite clear guidelines provided by the province for data sources, and there are two. There's the short form census and the long form census, and the short form census is filled out by everybody, and the long form census is voluntary and um, is just based on a sample size, and we know that in um, 2006, uh, there was um, a real issue around the data quality and, and the sample sizes. And so sometimes there are um, some of the changes. We, we rely on using the long form census because it provides a, uh, the housing information, but the short form census doesn't. And so sometimes um, the changes can be attributed to that. And I don't know if Eddie has anything to add there as well. Oh, you're muted, Abby. Yeah, just kind of reiterating what John said, we had to use the long form of the census because of those key measures that John went over, core, core housing need and extreme core housing need, they're only in the long form of the census. Um, so we took all our data from there and sometimes it, particularly with smaller populations, it would lead to some errors. Thank you. So can I ask a follow-up, Chair? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. So if that is a problem with the data, and this is a report that's meant for decision makers and developers, I think claiming that the population dropped by 28%, because I question that, I don't think it did drop by 28%. Is there a way to explain that the data may not be that reliable then? I just think it's a big, it's a big fluctuation in an important document. Thank you. So if you'll note, a uh, very good point, but if you'll note, uh, we have there is a section on uh, data limitations and caveats that uh, at the front of the document, and then it's included at the front of each and every section. So at the front end of that section for all electoral areas, we indicate that. And it, this is not just an issue for the RDOS, it's an issue for every single housing assessment that's uh, being done and is in the process of being done across the province. But we did put in, um, some language indicating some of the um, the, consider the data considerations that need to be um, acknowledged for this. Thank you, <laughs> Director. Thank you. Thank you to the chair. 
I had some initial technical difficulties, so hopefully you can hear me. If not, I might turn my video off. But again, to the chair, uh, thank you for the report. Really enjoyed reading it. Uh, my question, and you know, it may not be able to be answered here, but again, I know that you were talking about the South Mill community area and uh, Karameas and two homeless people. Uh, but then again, when we talk about the non-visible, and because of my role in emergency services, I, I, I know that we've got large clusters of people in dilapidated travel trailers um, living in, in agricultural crown land, et cetera, in appalling, no power, no water situations, um, and, a, and a large amount, like we're, we're, we're talking, you know, uh, a lot more substantial numbers than two. So is that what's reflected in the, you know, under the iceberg with the uh, non-visible, or is that something that needs to be somehow um, articulated in another way? Because again, they, they do have a roof, but it's uh, inappropriate. And a lot of times they're um, warehoused somewhere on a farm, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Director Roberts. Yes, that is something that is uh, indicated by, um, you know, the, the tip of the iceberg and uh, the hidden homeless population. We did, as part of this project, um, there's a qualitative research section where we reached out to service providers, including service providers in the uh, in the Sinopanine, South Sinopanine, um, to try and qualify and get some some of the information and some of the kind of the stories that are not captured uh, in, in any of the data. So that has been included in the different um, in the different sections. But I think that you do speak to you know what that hidden homeless population is and even when we're talking to um, service providers and others that there there are people that might be missed like the people you mentioned who might, you know living on crown land and you know kind of tucked away on, on trailers that might not be completely visible thank you to the okay. chair just to follow up uh yes and I, and I don't know because there's legalities involved in regards to confidentiality but if it's nothing in regards to specific names i would just know as a resource i'm a paramedic and Again, a lot of these people don't use a lot of those services um, and they really do fall under the radar, but we in our, in, in our line of work deal with them quite regularly. So just to think of that maybe be a source of information through that kind of system. I, and I don't know how you would do it, but just that it's a possible way of collecting further data in the future. Thank you, Director Roberts. Uh, Director Bloomfield? Thank you and hello everybody and um, and through the chair a quick question on the population decline. Uh, on could the uh, the increase of um, part time homeowners uh, skew the numbers on population decline uh, because the census does the census recognise population as those with a permanent residence in the electoral area or is the do they take into consideration part-time ownership. Go ahead, Mr. I don't believe that they that the census takes into account part-time um, residency, uh, that it is full time, so that could be a, a contributing <coughs> contributing factor. Thank you. Uh, does that answer your question, Director Winfield? Well, yes, and, uh, and it maybe leads to the answer of Director Gettin's question. Uh, you know, not not thinking that there's that significant decline in population because you know it depends on the season. There's got a full population on, so um, you know the, the the increase in the number of part-time homes is certainly skewing the figures on population. Thank you, Director Albrecht. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the chair. And I had uh, some questions related to what we're hearing uh, generally from Director Roberts and Gettins and, and Bloomfield. Um, I have concerns about the data not being reliable, not being accurate for similar reasons. 
uh, area D, OK Falls, has significant housing needs. We have people who are uh, right now in serious distress, living in trailers, uh, without homes, uh, income uh, affected, COVID related. So the the report just does not uh, appear to even capture those realities. Uh, area D is one of seven growth areas in the regional growth strategy. Uh, we have an industrial area that's about to, uh, uh, we're getting lots of interest in development, jobs are coming. We have significant real estate available for housing. Uh, we have, uh, you know, Premier Horgan uh, and, and Minister Robinson of Housing were in the community on March 13, 2019, and, and, and our MP, Richard Cannings. I spoke to all three of them about this and our significant need for, for assistance with housing. Uh, and so my question is, um, was there any view to the future in this work done? Was there any consultation with our South Skaha Housing Society in OK Falls, which has been working on housing for, well, since 1987, it's, it's a long time. We, we had one project uh, very successfully completed. Ribbon cutting was October 3rd, 2019. We have another phase two in the works. We, we have landowners who, who very badly uh, are looking for information because they'd like to do some housing. We have real opportunities to, to provide affordable housing. Uh, we have an industrial area. So was there any consultation with those groups, the Desert Sun Resource Center in South Okanagan? Uh, and, and, and my question is, if not, why not? And, and, and you know, that, that idea of, the consultation, if not, why not? But also the idea uh, view to a future, because really we're, we're, we're thinking strategically towards the future. This information would be very useful to planning and good planning developers and landowners and, and residents alike. So those are my questions. Thank you. Mr. Ingram, you have a. Thank you, Director Obrick. Uh, as I'd indicated to Director uh, Bloomfield, yes, we did speak to those uh, groups that you mentioned. Uh, as part of a qualitative outreach um, for, this, for this project. So speaking to housing providers and, and agencies throughout the region. Um, so we did we did speak with them and, and include that. Um, and you, you raise a point, I mean, yes, this is um, future looking and there is, uh, it's looking out to 2026, but it's, Basing some of that uh, on the 2016 census, which is five years ago, we're in a census period right now. Um, so it was really kind of doing the best with the information uh, on hand, augmenting it with uh, structured interviews with service providers, um, working and collecting you know data from uh, the real estate associations on sales values and, and the like. So trying to you know augment it with those key pieces of, of information. But as indicated at the front, it is a uh, a snapshot um, in in time and meant to support uh, future um, conversations and, and planning. Are you, do, you, do you have a redirect? Over? No. Thank you very much, uh, Director Montes. To the chair. I'm, I guess I'm wondering about Apex because that's a large part of my area that has got 500 condo townhouses, apartment sort of style homes, and they're mostly vacation rentals and they're mostly um, seasonal and some are full time, but the bulk are. And with only 14% of my area being um, recreation or, or rental, I'm I'm worried about the data because that doesn't seem um, complete for my area. And then I'm also wondering about PIB, uh, as mentioned as being part of my area, was there housing included in my area as well for all the, all the statistics? Thanks. Mr. Ingram. Uh, thank you, director. Um, so with, there is a section on, uh, the indigenous communities that in the RDOS and their housing, um, the, the, it was not included, you know, for uh, your electoral area as it's um, PID land. 
Um, but we know that, you know, with PIB that there's a, a lot of development that is going on uh, right now. A lot of uh, new leasehold uh, homes being developed. Um, I can't speak. I'd have to dig into the report. I can't speak specifically to the apex question. I'm not sure how we um, considered apex, um, but I would I would have to dig into that a little bit deeper. And we have we have good familiarity with the electoral area because we actually our firm worked on the OCP for the uh, area a few years back. So we're pretty. Um, well aware of you know apex and um you know it, the role that it plays in, in the electoral area but uh, we'd have to dig into that unless um Abby has anything off the top of her head um, um i don't have too much to add to that except uh, um maybe some of those vacation rentals might be reflected in the vacation rental data that we were looking at um because penticton that area certainly had the most. Thank you, uh, Director Montes. I redirect. Thank you, uh, Director Coin. I saw you had a hand up there. Thank you. Um, so I, I really want to uh, reiterate what uh, Director Roberts said about the homeless people in our area they're they're not the under the bridge type of homeless people they're the people that are living the in little camper trailers all over the bush here in uh agricultural areas in uh log logging areas where people where it's the roads the infrastructure's there so they're living there um in god knows what kind of conditions but the other thing is the amount of growth that we've had in our area in the last particularly probably three years has been phenomenal. And since you're working with information that's mostly six years old, is I find it not very relevant to what's on the ground today. Uh, so I, I'm a little skeptical, skeptical of the value of a lot of this information in, in this report. So um, I mean, I can't imagine how you would even begin to to look at what's happened in our area in the last few years. I mean, nobody really knows until you're out with boots on the ground and wandering around. But the other thing that's happened here is the distinction between have and have not in our community, where people in the service industry and uh, secondary industry that difference in wages between the two uh, major employers at, at Weyerhaeuser and uh, at the mine has left this incredible gap that now the rents have gone through the roof, that people are now struggling, anybody in the service industry, to find adequate housing, whether you're in the town or you're in the regional district. It is becoming uh, absolutely horrendous job for people to try and keep a roof over their head in our area. Thank you. Mr. Ingram, Ms. Warren, do you have a comment on that? Um, thank you, Director Coyne. We did, um, in the town of Princeton did its own uh, regional, or uh, regional, did its own housing assessment, and we actually pulled that information into this report to give a full regional picture and they had you know identified some of the issues that that you talked about but I do want to address the point of, about data um, again yes there there are qualifications around the data uh, we did follow the guidelines that the province had um, used for this I feel that this is and this is my my personal uh, opinion right now but this is the first time the province has any has ever undertaken something of this scale and magnitude because it's not just the RDOS. This is for every regional district in the province and every, every local government in the province is completing a housing assessment. Um, it would be my my hope that uh, the province is able to do a review um, of some of these questions that you know have come up not only in this but I, I we have worked on other housing assessments and going 
you know, in our review of other regional housing assessments as well, um, that potentially in when the next one um, comes due in uh, five years time, uh, that there might be a slightly different um, process similar to, I was thinking about the community and en energy and emissions inventories, which was uh, the province used to track uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and it was actually a kind of a pretty leading edge, which I think this is as well. Um, and hadn't been done at uh, such a scale, but though the methodology has changed and become refined over time. And I would suspect it might be um, a similar uh, situation with this. The other issue that I'd point out as well is I think that when we move into the uh, next one, we'll be able to um, leave behind the 2006 census, which was pretty deeply flawed. I don't know if people can remember back to 2006, but it, um, you know, the, the data out of that census is has a lot of, a lot of issues. So uh, the future work will be able to use 2021 um, data, which might uh, help and see some improvements in uh, future uh, housing assessments. Thank you. Director Gettins, please. Thank you to the chair. Um, I'm just curious how the area of Red Wing was approached by the researchers here. Um, Red Wing is PIB land, but it's also part of Electoral Area F. And so I see it mentioned under Electoral Area F, but not on the PIB website. And I'm just wondering if that contributes at all to the 28% decrease in population. So if I could just get a bit of clarity on how that, how you approach Red Wing, that would be great. Mr. Ingram. Thank you, Director Gatton. So we're quite aware of Red Wing. We did have, uh, our firm was uh, the firm that worked on the uh, OCP update for Electoral Area F. Um, Red Wing was not included. We know that there is an issue with Red Wing and that it is a PIB development, but it's on uh, not all PIB land. There's a, a survey, um, some survey issues there. So um, Red Wing, it, it doesn't account for that uh, for that drop, um, and it was not included, you know, as part of general area F uh, housing or population numbers. Okay, and is. But was it included as part of, sorry, as a follow up chair, was it included as part of area or PIB's report? Because Skaha Hills is, or was it just omitted from the report? Um, it was included when we looked at uh, in the Indigenous housing section with the information that we were able to um, pull and include in that uh, section. <clears throat> Director Gettins, does that answer your question? Thank you. Director Bloomfield, I see you have a hand up. Sorry, that's an errant hand. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Director Holmes, I see uh, you had your hand up there a while back. No. Uh, Director Obrick. Thank you very much to the chair, and, and I do have um, a concern uh, and, and, a, and a further question. Uh, I fear the report falls short of meeting our needs in OK Falls, Area D. Uh, Director uh, Bob Coyne really contributed the, the very similar concerns that we have in our community for very similar reasons. Uh, our economy is turning. We're, we're going to have more jobs, more needs. Um, the, the homelessness, it, this is a significant uh, issue right now. The emails I'm getting right now, real, real, and I know the report uh, may have been, uh, the work may have been done a few weeks ago, a few months ago, so it may not be up to date to right now. I get that. But um, with respect to my question about consultation, my information is different than the answer given. Um, I did call the South Skaha Housing Society and just double checked and they were not consulted. Indeed, they reached out and, and were unsuccessful. Um, I spoke with staff in January on this concern to make sure we were consulted. Uh, we have landowners with uh, 15 acres of land available for housing now. I, I don't think they were consulted. I know I wasn't consulted. 
and our economic development officer coordinator was not consulted. We have a guiding document of this board that includes housing as a concern. Um, that appears to the disconnect here in the consultation process. And this is a feeling that the community feeling is it's like a don't ask, don't listen approach. And so I repeat my question, but a little differently this time. And, and why were those groups not consulted? That's my question. Thank you very much. Mr. Ingram. I am. I'm quite sure that the South Skaha Housing Association was contacted. Uh, Evelyn Reichert, who um, formerly with the district, now back doing some contract uh, work with the district, um, led outreach. And I can go back into um, the report and and double check. But I have some confidence that she did um, reach out to them, and this was an issue that came up and I think we had double checked it as well, but again, I can, uh, I will, I will double check that so as to avoid that, you know, he said, she said kind of situation. Um, and I'm not sure. Yes, I, I don't think that the economic development coordinator was, uh, um, con consulted, uh, in this, um, we could follow up on that, but I, I think that, you know, again, I, I reiterate that we were, that the province under the Local Government Act lays out a process and the 50 data points that our data is collected on, and there is a, you know, quite a rich and economic development has come up a few times, so there's a, a lot of uh, employment um, data that's available in the uh, Excel spreadsheets. But, you know, this report did follow um, the structure laid out under the, the guidelines and, and the act, and we did um, augment that with um, the outreach that was conducted by um, Evelyn Reichert, and it's reported in the, in the, the strategy. And again, we can, we can follow up and, and double check that on South Scott, and I'm quite sure, or the housing side rather, but I'm, I, have, I, have a, I have some confidence that they were um, contacted, but we can follow up after this. Redirect. Yes, yes, and yes, thank you very much. I appreciate that follow up. I hope I do receive it from somebody. Uh, there is certainly some misunderstanding here because, again, I spoke with the president of the society between my two questions, and so there's a real absence or gap in the uh, information. Uh, I represent the community concern. I, I listen to the concern. I present it. So I, I sure appreciate your uh, doing that and getting back to me. Um, and, and again, we when when this uh, study was uh, supported by the board, I spoke to the need to, uh, you know, how important this was for Area D. Okay, falls uh, to your second point, and I sure appreciate your limitations. Uh, I've often said, if you ask the wrong question, you'll get the wrong answer. And so I think what we need, and this is feedback, and maybe you can take it to the province for next time, as you said, next time will likely be better. Uh, I, I think there's room here uh, to maybe change those uh, terms of engagement, those terms of reference, so they are uh, a little more um, focused on these uh, areas of need. I, I'm hearing similar comments from Director Roberts, Director Coyne, Director Gettins. Uh, you know, this is an opportunity to, to, to learn from this feedback, and maybe next time the answer would be our uh, guidelines uh, permitted us to do those things instead of our guidelines did not permit us to do those things. Thank you. Thank you, Director Ulbrich. Director Roberts? Uh, thank you to the chair. It's just a quick question and, and a frame of reference. Um, especially with the census coming up. In Area G, uh, most of the population lives like on mobile home parks. And I'm wondering whether or not are where I've got what are considered in um, lack of a better term, like the RV resort versus a uh, park model RV co-op versus a mobile home park. 
So like, for instance, between there's two units that I got on highway three that in and of it by themselves, there is 240 um, households. Um, how do those look in regards to statistics, stats, and how would they, do you know how they would um, be represented in census? Mr. Ingram? I might direct that uh, question to, to Evie. Um, I, I know that the housing types are uh, broken out, and we also include BC assessment data, which would provide um, there is a quite an extensive list of the different um, types of, of housing broken down. I, I don't and I would imagine that there are different types of uh, mobile or temporary um, mobile uh, homes that are included in BC um, assessments um, data. Um, Abby, I don't know if there's anything you want to hit this for. Yeah. Well, along with this report, we have um, some pretty long Excel spreadsheets with sort of more fine grained data and the census collects um, housing types like it would say mobile dwellings. And then we also use the BC assessment, which would break it down even further um, to like even more specific than that. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Coins uh, Jr, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is more of a comment than anything. Um, the town of Princeton did our housing needs study before um, everybody else. And we found we had the same issues. There was no, um, the growth projections weren't there. Um, the data that we have is out of date because it's from the old census. Um, what I've already done is I've already reached out to the premier and I want, I've asked them to consider um, moving the date for the next one to um, so the, it's after the next census instead of before the census because we're working with the oldest possible data that we can get. And I think that's the same thing this board needs to do is we need to put up a, a resolution in front of the UBCM asking the UBCMs for support to ask the province to move that date till after the next census so that we can get the proper information. And then if there's other things that we find, we need to ask for those changes as well. So if we feel that there's things that are missing from the reporting or from the guidelines and we need to ask the province to change that. It's not up to our contractors to ask for that change. It's up to us as the elected officials to ask for that change. So I feel like right now I know there's a lot of frustration and there seems to be some going around in circles here, but it's on us to ask the UBCM or the province to move forward with with this request. So um, I'm not going to make a motion of that, but I think we need to do that down the road. I have to step out for a minute, but I just wanted to say that before I, I ran away. So. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Director Coyne. I, uh, I see our clock is ticking here. We've got one more uh, question uh, from Director Obrick, please. Uh, yes, and thank you to Director Spencer Coyne. I agree with him completely on the uh, last point that we can do something through UBCM or otherwise, and boy, do I agree with him on the idea. But I disagree with him a little bit in that I do think the contractors here also have an opportunity and I would implore them to give some feedback to the province also. I don't think it's wrong for them to give that feedback. I think we both can give the feedback. And I think if we both endeavor to give the feedback, our prospects for a better outcome next time go up, not down. And so to that extent, uh, I just wanna add to Director Spencer Coyne's excellent suggestion and add to it, perhaps uh, the contractors can do what they can in delivering this feedback, uh, since I imagine they do a lot of this work, they might actually uh, get, get listened to by the problems. At least I sure hope they do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Overt. As I said, our clock is ticking here, but I'd like to thank the delegation very much. I did find the report very, very interesting. I do realize the limitations on surgical, uh, surgically trying to extract the information, especially on homelessness. It's got to be an extremely difficult uh, target to hit uh, precisely. And I, I, I do believe that uh, we'll only get better in the future. Uh, Director Obrick's suggesting that uh, you put forward suggestions to the board that we can pass on to the province is outstanding. And, and uh, I thank you again. 
All right, I don't see any other questions for the panel, so we'll move on. Uh, it's uh, past our clock for this uh, committee, so I'd be looking for uh, a motion to adjourn. Director Obrick, Director Robinson second. Thank you. We are out of committee. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Chair Knodel. We're going to move on to Protective Services Committee, and I'll turn things over to Chair Roberts. Go ahead, please, Chair Roberts. Uh, thank you. I'd like to have a motion to uh, for the agenda in regards to protective service. I see uh, Director Bush and Director Holmes. All in favor? Uh, looks like that's good. Thank you. I'd like to be able to pass the uh, over to the CAO uh, in regards to the issues with the, the upcoming information around the emergency services. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I'm going to get to why I'm back at you with this issue uh, shortly, but um, I do want to talk to you about the Regional Emergency Management Program and the discussions that have been going on over the past uh, uh, probably year and a half now. And uh, as to a current update, and uh, first of all, uh, you'll notice in the report that there are a list of priorities with regards to regional emergency management. Um, those are the EMBC uh, priority list. So it always says people are first uh, in an emergent response. And uh, they always look at uh, safety of first responders. And I'm sure you'll appreciate that, Mr. Chair. Uh, always look at first responders uh, as the primary uh, issue, not sending people into uh, situations that are unsafe. But then other than that, it, it all is about protecting uh, lives and then property and then the environment and then the economy. So we've adopted uh, that type of a priority list in our emergency response plan for the regional district. And I would assume that most other local governments around the province have done that as well. Uh, just makes sense. So over the past uh, year, we've been talking about the benefit of the regional emergency response service. And we know that uh, of uh, primary interest was that value for money uh, discussion that we were having with our incorporated communities. Uh, so uh, we've been working at this initially, uh, we did it uh, in sort of a joint session, but uh, recently more so with the CAO group. And uh, we've uh, completed our discussions uh, on that uh, with the CAO group now, and uh, hence why I'm bringing it forward to the Protective Services Committee. Uh, but generally, uh, historically, uh, this regional service was established back in 2006. It was an outcome of the Filman report uh, that resulted from the 2003 fires uh, in the Okanagan, uh, a catastrophic event that really focused on uh, how important it was that uh, we work together on emergency response. And they promoted then the regionalization uh, of emergency management. So since 2006 and uh, the promulgation of bylaw 2376, uh, 2375, which is our service establishment bylaw for the regional program, uh, we have been working uh, with all, initially with the 14 jurisdictions within the regional district and now the 15. So everybody's a participant, all six uh, municipalities and uh, all nine electoral areas. So a full regional program on this. We spend most of our time on preparation. So the Regional Emergency Management Program uh, really focuses on training and exercising and documents, making sure that uh, we have a coordination set up uh, with all the participants uh, and other interested stakeholders uh, like uh, uh, the provincial ministries that are very involved in emergency management, not only EMBC, but also uh, the Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resources, Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, Ministry of Environment, 
uh, all of those uh, are on a regular uh, conference call when we um, are in the preparation mode, but certainly more so even when we're in response mode. But you can see that there are four steps in the emergency management framework, uh, starting with preparedness. Um, uh, the, the second step, response, gets most of the attention. So when there's an event or an incident, uh, clearly uh, that uh, gets the attention of everybody, whether it's uh, local, regional, provincial, or uh, national. Um, so uh, we tend to focus on response, but really it's the other side of it. It's the preparedness. Uh, just like our armed forces, uh, hopefully, uh, we never end up back in a war, but uh, their primary focus then is training so that they can respond in the event of one of those events. It's the same with emergency management. Um, so, uh, and then on the back end of that, after an event is over, there's always the recovery part. And then mitigation is one of those uh, four stages in the framework. We don't uh, focus a lot on mitigation. We do uh, sort of from a wildfire uh, perspective because there are uh, lots of grants on that but we don't uh, we've talked about it but we don't have a service uh, for flood mitigation or uh, uh, some of the other events uh, that would occur so most of our time out of the program preparedness certainly if there is an incident or event response uh, takes uh, that's uh, sort of a red risk for us that's a drop tools type of event we focus our whole organization uh, on the response, uh, regardless of where it is in the regional district. And then uh, after that, uh, when, uh, when the lawyers and accountants come out, uh, we're into the recovery phase and who pays for what and who's responsible for what. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then in some respects, mitigation. Okay, so with that, uh, we want to talk, we, I, I want to move away from then uh, uh, the history of our program and the framework that's established by the province and talk about uh, really how we're set up now. And we've made some changes in our structure over the last year. Uh, you'll, require, you'll recall that um, we initially started out looking at our regulatory bylaw. We didn't look at the service establishment bylaw where the funding mechanism is set. We looked at our regulatory bylaw so that we could uh, go back and, and talk about structure. And uh, I mean, and I'm going to talk about the difference between a local program and a regional program uh, shortly as well. But the Emergency Program Act requires every local government to have an emergency response plan and, a, and an emergency response organization. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to talk about both. In our report, uh, clearly we're doing the, re the regional response, uh, but I want to talk about uh, how that works into the local programs as well. Because uh, they, they can mirror each other. There can be a local program and a regional program, and then it becomes about who pays for what. So, uh, and every local government does have an emergency response plan and our, an emergency response organi organization. You have to. So having said that, uh, in 2020, uh, when we went back and started looking uh, at the structure of our program, uh, there, we, we had a, a very complex emergency response organization for the regional district, and it actually included people in our organization that weren't part of the service. It included representatives from provincial agencies and uh, 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 more or less responders. Uh, whereas really at the policy level, what we want is uh, decision makers. So uh, we uh, made a transition from that previous emergency response organization to make the, our protective services committee responsible for the regional emergency management program. So all 19 of you, right? And you include representatives from each of those 15 jurisdictions. So as a policy group, uh, uh, we're now structured so that every one of our constituencies uh, participates in the decision-making process and sets policy for emergency management. 
and then has a responsibility for oversight on the regional emergency program. The other part of that structure uh, is the emergency planning team. So uh, in our definition, in our regulatory bylaw for emergency management, we identify the protective services committee as the policy group, and we identify the emergency management team as a CAO group. So the seven CAOs uh, that meet uh, uh, on a, on a really regular basis now uh, because we've added some responsibilities onto their uh, docket. So uh, throughout the COVID period, we were meeting uh, because that is an emergency response. And then certainly on the emergency management program, uh, we're meeting regularly. So we took the 2021 budget for the emergency management program through the CAO group first before it came up uh, uh, into the budget for 2021. And we'll do that in the future because you've tasked now that CAO group to do that. And over that time, uh, we've had a number of meetings on it and some, uh, some facilitated. We brought Ron Matusi in uh, to uh, facilitate a workshop on emergency management uh, at the CAO group level. And we've had uh, lots of benchmarking done to see what other regional districts do. Uh, and uh, we looked at various alternatives uh, to try and address that value for money issue uh, that uh, had been raised back in 2020. And uh, really, in the end, um, it came down to that we're always stronger together. So in an emergency management program, looking at the whole regional district and all of our 15 different constituencies, we're always stronger if we are working together, uh, getting out consistent messaging, uh, providing a coordinated response, using the same resources, looking for economies of scale, uh, training, uh, uh, using all of the human resources available within the regional district, uh, to fight uh, egregious situations, whether it's in one part of the regional district or whether it's pervasive. We are always stronger together and there would be no sense in breaking up uh, that partnership. So uh, that's the end result. And I'm gonna tell you how we got there and uh, how we're gonna make this work in the future. Always part of an emergency response plan uh, is a hazard assessment. Uh, clearly, within our valleys, uh, fire and flood are the two main ones. Uh, obviously, there's uh, slides, uh, debris-type slides, mudslides, uh, uh, that type of event, which we've uh, had several times in the, in the past. Uh, wind can be uh, an emergent event. And um, other than that, uh, when we look at... Uh, and. Uh, frankly, most of our events start in the regional district and then they may move towards an incorporated community. Um, but for the most part, they usually start in some remote part of the regional district, whether it's a fire or a flood. Uh, fires are fast moving events. Uh, floods are slow moving events where you can see them coming and have more time to plan. But certainly fires uh, are quick moving events. And uh, thankfully, uh, the Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural and Resources uh, through their uh, BC wildfire uh, response team uh, usually are the site management coordinators for fires, whereas floods uh, a little bit different. But nevertheless, uh, it's usually a start point in the regional district and then uh, incorporated communi communities are implicated. So whether they act as a reception center for people coming out of the danger areas in the regional district, or whether it's uh, an actual hazard approaching um, their community, either through a fire like the Christie Mountain Fire, uh, which never really got into the city of Penticton, but certainly was a threat, uh, a high level threat that had to be planned for, uh, or a flood, uh, which uh, may start in the uplands and then uh, come down the streams and rivers and eventually end up in the lakes, uh, which have uh, an implication for our incorporated communities. So uh, 
it's much better when we're operating together, knowing that uh, we're, we're stronger that way. So uh, the, the threats uh, we have to plan for. So that's part of the preparedness package. And uh, we would always be stronger if we're doing the same training, uh, if we're exercising together, uh, if we're talking together through these coordination meetings, uh, if we're uh, participating uh, in identifying resources, whether it's equipment or human or financial uh, for when an event happens. Um, but clearly it uh, behooves us to uh, uh, talk with each other and uh, work with each other. So uh, we talked about that at the CAO group. And of course, uh, there's different capabilities uh, within that group. So uh, we have uh, 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 great discrepancies in population, say between uh, Carameas and a Penticton. So then how do you make that beneficial to all of the 85,000 citizens that live within the regional district of Okanagan Similkameen, regardless of geographic jurisdiction? Um, because when we charge out through the emergency management program, a regional program, uh, we charge each of our citizens uh, basically the same amount. Uh, so they pay on uh, assessment, uh, so property and improvements, and uh, they get taxed uh, so that they each pay that same amount. So regardless of where they live in the regional district, uh, they get a bill from the regional district for the emergency management program and it's basically the same. Uh, they all get the same benefit from it. And we'll talk more about the funding uh, model uh, in a bit. Um, so we, at the CAO group level, I mean, clearly where we've uh, come up short in the past is that the regional program uh, like I said, when, when there is an event in the regional district, for the regional district, that's a red risk and we drop tools and we apply our organization uh, to the event. So uh, we immediately populate the Emergency Operations Center uh, and we keep at it uh, as long as it takes. So if that's a 24 hour, uh, seven day a week operation uh, for uh, sometimes uh, the six or seven months, uh, like it was in 17 and 18 with the floods, uh, we service that emergency operations center and we divert our staff from their normal tasks and put them into the emergency operations. And we train them in between that. So when there's no event happening, we train all of our uh, employees. In fact, for all of our um, exempt employees, it, it's in their job description that they are a member of the Regional Emergency Management Organization. And uh, then there is no discussion about that. Uh, they simply show up when they're identified on the roster uh, to take a shift and um, they're, they're trained to do that. And we understand why. I mean, uh, when you're talking about uh, saving lives or saving critical infrastructure or uh, 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 large tracts of property uh, that becomes more important than uh, our normal uh, types of uh, services. Okay. What we need to do is we need to rely more heavily on our incorporated communities. So if we're if this is a regional program, uh, we need to make sure that we're inviting uh, the resources from the incorporated communities into the program. What we were discussing at the CAO group is uh, certainly uh, we need to do more combined training and we need to do more combined exercising so that uh, if in uh, a situation like the Christie Mountain Fire, uh, where Heritage Hills uh, was the initial point of attack, uh, that as it approached the city of Penticton, then maybe at that point, um, I mean, we always have used uh, some employees from incorporated communities. Uh, the GIS staff from the city of Penticton are always uh, rely, we always rely on them in our EOC. Uh, the uh, experienced emergency coordinators 
um, we've, we've brought in uh, in the past uh, from incorporated communities to serve as the director of the regional EOC. What we need to do is make sure that we use everybody and that we train uh, so that everybody's comfortable coming into the regional EOC. And then we need to establish those liaisons uh, so that, say, in a Christie Mountain fire, uh, instead of creating two uh, emergency operations centers, which meant some of our support functions were getting directions from two organizations, and some uh, of the communications uh, were somewhat complicated because there were two EOCs. Uh, much of the stuff that was pointed out in the Christie Mountain Fire After Action Report is we would have been uh, better off if uh, we had had the one emergency operations center, but uh, relied more heavily on coordination with the city of Penticton so that they didn't have to establish their own. So that sort of liaison uh, was pointed out in the after action report. So, uh, and we talked about that and, and uh, we had the opportunity uh, to exercise it at a tabletop exercise on March 24th. I'm gonna talk about that um, afterwards. Uh, but uh, that was a, a tabletop uh, exercise is really a discussion where various scenarios are thrown at the group and uh, you have that discussion as to uh, what the best solution would be. So, uh, and, I'll, and I'll talk about that as to who was involved in that uh, shortly. The other thing I wanted to point out is that uh, we know that this program got started uh, out of the Filman report after the 2003 fires. And uh, the province of British Columbia is currently undergoing a review of the Emergency Program Act. And it's an old act, hasn't been changed for a long time. And uh, they've, they've gone through a consultation process and uh, it, it, I think, is close to getting to the point where they're going to come out with a, a draft amendment uh, on it, if not a new uh, act. Uh, but clearly, the way they're heading, uh, from what I've seen, is that they are promoting even more so uh, regional participation and cooperation and partnerships. Uh, all the stuff that we've already incorporated into ours, uh, they are heading that way through provincial legislation now. Um, uh, just because it makes sense. The, uh, and I have to say, like, really, uh, in, in this regional district, we're a little bit ahead. There, there are only a few other uh, regional districts that have a full regional program. So I don't, uh, I don't know if the amendments to the Emergency Program Act are going to be as as uh, significant for us as they will for some other regional districts that haven't gone that way. But uh, clearly uh, that is still uh, the predominant recommendation from the province. So whether it was the filming report or whether it's this amendment of the Emergency Program Act, they're still clearly looking at uh, regional cooperation. So when we were at the CAO, CAO group and we were uh, finishing up, and uh, I mean, this was, uh, uh, this was a messy discussion. Uh, we looked at all sorts of different options uh, as to whether uh, the regional program would be just a very basic uh, tenant and then contract with uh, incorporated communities to offer, offer different levels of service uh, or uh, uh, various other options. Uh, that were out there. We found some other options that were working in other areas. And uh, in the end, uh, what it came down to is that uh, we had this, uh, we, we had this uh, event uh, that really clarified for us uh, where we needed to go. So after all this discussion, uh, there was the Christie Mountain Fire back in August of 2020, and that after action report came out with a whole bunch of recommendations uh, from a practical situation. Uh, and uh, that's what we sort of relied on in, in the end. This ally uh, emergency management uh, group that did the after action report uh, came out with some uh, good advice uh, on our program. Uh, 
Uh, they looked at it and they said, uh, listen, uh, you should have had just one emergency operations center during that, after, during that Christie Mountain fire. It was very confusing uh, to a lot of people uh, uh, who needed clear direction and weren't getting clear direction uh, because there was two EOCs. So command and control, they said you're always going to be better with one emergency operations center than if you have more. The other thing they said was you need to do a much better job uh, in using liaison officers. There always is a position called liaison officer in every emergency response organization. Uh, so in, in for our incorporated communities in your emergency response plan, uh, if you were to look at a flow chart for your response organization, you would see liaison officer. Uh, we haven't typically uh, used that to the full extent. We've certainly had liaison officers during responses, but uh, what they're saying is uh, you need to be much more aggressive in making sure that all of the agencies that are important to the response uh, are already prepared to do so. So you need to do all of that work in advance. So whether it's uh, interior health, if there's a health emergency or an evacuation of a hospital, uh, or if it's FLNRO with regards to uh, flooding, or if it's environment with regards to permitting, or if it's MOTI with regards to roads and culverts, that all has to be worked out beforehand and there has to be a clear understanding that they will show up uh, in your EOC when you have an event uh, that requires them. And not only them, but uh, first responders as well. It's always important to have the RCMP available. Uh, uh, certainly the fire response has to be a coordinated response. And uh, uh, from a health point of view, how you transport people, especially if there's an evacuation, uh, how you transport vulnerable people needs to be coordinated with uh, BC Ambulance. So uh, all of that has to be organized uh, initially. So they're saying we could have done that better. Um, they did point out that uh, we did a couple things really well uh, because we have practiced and used uh, GIS personnel from various incorporated communities in, in uh, all of our responses dating back uh, years and they're already familiar and comfortable with our emergency uh, management dashboard and our mapping systems uh, that that worked very well even though with Christy Mountain Fire we were in the middle of a cyber attack and we didn't have uh, we, we had uh, uh, placemats uh, sort of thing like pictures of our, of our maps but we weren't live uh, because we were completely isolated from the internet uh, due to our cyber attack. But nevertheless, uh, the GIS people uh, are smart enough to work around that and uh, we were able to provide uh, all of the information necessary uh, to help BC Wildfire uh, fight that fire. And then the other part of it was the communication because uh, uh, the communications officers in the incorporated communities work well together. So uh, really there was only uh, when I, when I say communication officers, really it's only the regional district and uh, the uh, city of Penticton that have designated uh, communications officers. Uh, they're used to working together and uh, they did a good job coordinating that. And communication is so important during any emergency response. It's, it's never enough. Uh, we'll never be perfect on that, but the need to get information out especially in this day of uh, social media uh, is critical. And at the same time, uh, because we're the government in those situations, it has to be verified. Uh, it can't be based on rumors or gossip or speculation or opinion. Uh, it, it's so critical that we get our message out, but that it be the correct information and uh, still try and be timely in order to keep up with these other uh, mechanisms. So communications was good, um, uh, although they say we, we certainly could do more training uh, in order to make sure that uh, that's still live during the next one. And then uh, they made a, a recommendation uh, on the reception center. So, uh, and this is somewhat tied to the command and control. Um, I'm doing on time here. 
<laughs> three minutes. We may we may not actually get then to the uh, uh, the exercise report, um, but uh, this this I think is the crux of it is that uh, we may need to just treat reception centers like a site. So if the event is out in the regional district, but we're sending all of our people uh, into a reception center in an incorporated community, there has been some confusion in the past with regards to who actually operates the reception center. Of course, it's the, our emergency support services, but who are they getting their direction from? That uh, uh, became a focus point during uh, the Christie Mountain Fire, and I know it was an issue in Princeton uh, a few years ago. Uh, and I, I think we've actually got a direction now on how this could work best, is that it, it may just be another site. So in the incident command system, the reception center may just be treated like an incident as a site. And we turn that over uh, uh, to the receiving community to run, but they, they, they report back into the regional EOC uh, through a liaison. So I think we're, we're just about there. We're still working on the details of that, but uh, I think we're getting closer on it because it's an important component. And then they do give us some recommendations on uh, training and exercising together and uh, that we do the same training and exercise so that when our people merge uh, during an event that they're all working off of the same hymn book uh, instead of uh, different ones. So uh, I think I'm, uh, uh, the report is, is a little more extensive. Uh, I go in again on the funding part of it because value for money was the focus of this when we started. Um, but really, uh, all it says is that uh, this is a regional program. We charge all of our citizens the same amount for the regional program. We have different collection mechanisms. For rural residents, we send our requisition to the province. They send out a bill to the rural residents. They charge them five and a quarter percent on top of that for doing it. Uh, but for urban citizens, uh, we send our bill to the uh, incorporated communities and they send it out with their tax notice and they collect it for us. And then the province doesn't charge them that extra five and a quarter percent. So, but in the, in the end, one program, two collection systems, province for rural citizens, incorporated communities for urban citizens, but it's the same amount for all of the 85,000 citizens. It's just a different collection system. Uh, that's what it comes down to. Uh, and then uh, in the report, um, we just identify uh, some of the current activities that come out of the uh, Regional Emergency Management Program. Uh, basically, the program is funded. 20% uh, of our emergency uh, program manager comes out of that program and 50% of the emergency program coordinator. So there's not even one position charged to emergency management. All of the costs during an event, like during a response, are paid for uh, by the organization responding. So our citizens, uh, 85,000 of them, uh, when uh, we're in the regional EOC, whoever is in that EOC charges their wage to the service that they would normally charge to. It's not charged to emergency management. If they work overtime, that's paid by EMBC uh, through an emergency authorization form. Or if we hire consultants, that's all paid for by EMBC. It's not, it's not targeted to, uh, uh, to the regional management program. It's targeted to those other services, those other 150 services that we offer, our staff are still charged to them. Um, but uh, that's... Uh, uh, that seems to be the prudent way to do it. So I think I'll leave it there, uh, Mr. Chair. The, there was another item on the agenda, and I'll bring that back, but really uh, the exercise on March 24th was a discussion uh, for CAOs, uh, the emergency program coordinators, and uh, the communication uh, officers. And uh, we resolved a lot there, but uh, the facilitator for that program, uh, Red Dragon, uh, which is Paul Edmonds and his associates, they're doing an after action, an after exercise report 
uh, that will be ready for us by the end of April. So uh, we'll bring that back uh, when we get their final report. So that would be it for me, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, CAO. Very, very well spoken and very a lot of information to digest. Um, as we move into any questions, I think I saw Director Obrick. Was that your hand up earlier? Yeah. Uh, so, Director Obrick, yeah, you're first up. Thank you very much to the chair, and and I want to say. Uh, thank you to the CAO. That was an excellent report on very important and very challenging subject matter. Uh, I, I appreciate the, the work done uh, and, and the information uh, so much. And on behalf of my community, you know, this is, uh, we lived it, so we know firsthand uh, how good the EOC services were, the evacuation. And, and we also know what some of the challenges were. Um, my, my, my comment and my question relates to the CAO's uh, comment about responsibility for oversight and importance of value for money. And uh, boy, uh, he's right on the, the, the bullseye with the importance of that. Uh, EMBC, the report Ally Emergency Management did, was excellent insofar as it went but it was very disappointing for what it didn't do. Uh, it had wrong information about the start of the fire. Those details are interesting. But more importantly, it, it appears to be yet another example of a don't ask, don't listen approach. And, and, and the, the fundamental problem is probably the terms of engagement. Uh, when I spoke to the author, uh, Paul Aldrich, and I may have mispronounced his name, uh, he, he explained that he's just following the directions given by staff. I don't know if he means EMBC staff or EOC staff or RDOS staff, but the report referred to 500 stakeholders being consulted. Sounds like a lot. Turns out it was only 12 to 15 who were directly consulted. The rest were all indirect through those 12 or 15. Not a single consult, not a single question, not a single listen to the elected area director, which just so, ha so happened to be me. I heard from so many community members with so many concerns. All that information's in my head and it's quite useless. Uh, you know, no getting it. Uh, I, I don't think the board is, you know, you know, wants to hear me talk about that today or even another day. So how do we get that information to the people who need it? Uh, they did not speak to a single member of the community evacuated, 320 houses, not a single one was consulted, not a single one had an opportunity to give feedback, information. We thereby learn nothing from that opportunity that we've missed. Value for money, we, we spend the money and what, what do we get back? And, and for those of you who are business focused, imagine if you had a restaurant and you had an event and after the event, you spoke to the cook and, and, and the receptionist and the manager, but, but nobody asked a single customer what they thought of the food or the service or the menu or the experience. That's not how things are done in business. That's not how business people respect their money when they have uh, something to learn. And yet we all uh, are part of this process we have, as the CAO said, a responsibility for oversight. My question is, is there anything we can do? Is there a letter we can send of concern to EMBC, a polite letter, a positive letter, an appreciative letter, but one that nonetheless asks that maybe next time when they're doing this work, there might be some value received. Uh, indeed, I asked the, the expert who did this report, the question I put to him, would there be value if they did consult the people evacuated? He said, yes, absolutely. His expert opinion, yes. And my question, well, why didn't you? His answer was, well, the terms of engagement, the, the limits that were put on him by the people who paid him. So when we're talking about value for money, responsibility for oversight, I just want to put that question out. I, I hope there's a, a, a something we can do. Thanks. 
Director Obrick, uh, um, CAO, can you answer that question? Or I didn't get the question out of that. I, I thought it was a good uh, comment, but I didn't get a question. For no, me. no, my, my question, I'll repeat. I, 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 I can actually remember it. Um, <laughs> the question is, can we, as an organization, can we send a letter of concern to e EMBC thanking them for the wonderful job done by Ally Emergency and all the good work done, but is it possible, maybe in the future, to include uh, asking people, the ratepayers, the taxpayers, the people who pay the money, the, the, the value, the money we're valuing, we, we want to get value for the money, those taxpayers, our responsibility for oversight, is it possible to send a communication to them uh, expressing this concern so that we can get the value of the learning, the feedback, information. This speaks to communication, this speaks to the liaison, this speaks to all the things that were in this very excellent report today, but there's value that we're missing because we're not listening. So that's my question, can we do that? Thank you. Mm. Uh, well, we can certainly send a letter. Uh, to tell you the truth, uh, from all of my experience, and I've seen a lot of act after action reports, is uh, they're, uh, they're pretty typical. They look at it from an emergency management response. So the experts will look at command and control uh, in the emergency operations center. They'll look at the communication program from a technical point of view. Uh, all of those other things that were identified in the Ally report. If we're looking for uh, a citizen opinion, like how did we do? Uh, is there anything we could have done better? Uh, those types of questions you sort of ask in a citizen survey. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the regional district doing our own survey uh, on that. I don't, I don't think the province from, if they're setting provincial guidelines on after action reports, I don't know if they would actually uh, change their reports, but there would be nothing wrong with us doing our own study. Okay, so your thought is they're not interested in hearing back what the community members who were receiving the service experienced. There, there's a lot of value here, I believe, and maybe we can't do it, but the value that I see is um, a lot of positives. There were a lot of things done really well, and I think there's value in hearing back on the positives, but there were some areas that could have been uh, different and different in a way that might have been better. And I think that matters for people who are facing this kind of emergency in the future. And if any of you are ever evacuated and any of you have these issues, and you know, I doubt it'll happen again in a pandemic with COVID and a, and a computer crash and all the difficulties that we experience. So I'm sure next time will be better, I hope, because there won't be those other factors. But um, when you're in it, when you're seeing it uh, happen in real time, when you see how terrified people are, uh, when you see the difficulties they had, the challenges, the upset, and I got to hear it. I got to hear it from lots of people. Well, I don't think I'm the right person to be hearing it. I think the experts, EMBC, for example, uh, they should be interested, I would think, and those of us in administration who are doing the EOC and, and the fire protective services and, and all the related services that were provided, I would think every one of those service providers would want to know uh, this kind of information. And I think we're missing out because we're not listening and we're not listening because normal is how this is done. And I heard that from uh, the, the author of the Ally Emergency Management uh, Contract, the, the uh, after action report, normal becomes the reason. And, and I'm not sure normal's the best reason. Uh, I'm the Thank best you, reason uh, Director Oberick. I Thank you. Excuse me, I think just in case we have other people. Um, and done. first off, uh, again, I think it was, it's in, no worries. And I, and I think yeah, point taken. I think it was uh, CAO mentioned that uh, we, of course, can do a community survey uh, to the citizen out of the RDOS level. And at the same time, we can always send a letter um, 
asking if they would put that within their purview. Uh, does anybody else have any uh, questions, concerns, or anything? Uh, okay, I say uh, Director Holmes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm certainly encouraged by this report. I think um, if we can uh, coordinate and formalize our cooperation, regional cooperation, that, that could be a good thing. Uh, I just have a question regarding the uni unity of command and the problem of having two uh, C EOCs and, and specifically the location of an EOC. And I'm just wondering what the general thinking is in terms of where that EOC would be located, uh, would it be in centralized in in Penticton at the at the RDS office? And and if you have, if for an example, if you have a an interface fire that's uh, burning in both Meadow Valley and and Summerland, for example, and we're drawing on the resources of Summerland, where where would that EOC be located? Uh, thank you, CAO. So could you speak to that? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the model we're looking at is that, uh, and in a Summerland example, is that if there's a fire that starts out in the regional district and uh, say it's a large one and there's evacuations and uh, chances are uh, we would move people uh, into either Summerland or Penticton uh, for the reception center. We've done both in the past. For, uh, and there'd be multiple sites, I'm sure. Uh, so, with the emergency operations center, if there's multiple sites, chances are uh, it would remain in the regional emergency operations center in Penticton. But for the Summerland event, we may turn it over to the uh, Summerland CAO to be the EOC director. So, uh, if it was a situation like uh, Christie Mountain, um, chances are we would have started out with a regional emergency operations center with the regional emergency uh, regional ma uh, regional district staff manning it as it approached uh, as as the heritage hills situation improved and as uh, the focus became more uh, the city of penticton uh, that would have been a good time to turn it over to the city of penticton uh, emergency operations director and if they wanted to bring city of Penticton staff into the EOC or, or if they wanted sector tables, say like for the evacuation, um, then uh, that would have operated out of one emergency operations center. Uh, we always are turning over emergency uh, management positions. So in the EOC, the EOC director may be the, uh, the CAO for a certain period, then, then uh, because sometimes they go 24 hours for many days, uh, you have different people operating within that position. Uh, we've had the uh, CAO for the city of Penticton in the, in the 2018 floods uh, was a prominent EOC director in the regional EOC. And I think uh, when I mentioned before, we need to do that progressive training so that we have many, many people uh, trained uh, to operate in a regional system uh, using the same people and getting to know each other, that that's how we would do it. We would transition incorporated community staff into the regional EOC. If it is a situation, I forget when it was, I think it was 20, uh, back in like 2014 with the Testa Linden slide just south of Oliver, we did move the EOC down into Oliver because it was an isolated situation uh, and it was intense uh, at the time. Uh, but for the most part, uh, we would often have, uh, in the case of the floods, uh, we had uh, 15 sites. We had all 15 jurisdictions that were under state of local emergency. Uh, uh, other times with fires, we'll often have four or five different sites where we have uh, states of local emergency. So uh, I think the plan is, is that we would uh, primarily operate out of the EOC in Penticton. If it's an isolated site, we could uh, we, we have a trailer now. Uh, we can move our trailer uh, out uh, into a location. Um, but I think the important part is that we operate as one. Thank you, CAO. Um, it was great information. Um, does that answer your question, uh, Director Holmes? 
Okay, so now we've had a great dialogue with uh, Director Oberick and a lot of information from the CAO, and we've run on time. Uh, I think, um, could I have a, a motion to close um, protective services? Uh, thank you, Director Oberick and uh, Director Robertson. All in favor? Thank you. Okay, directors, we're going to move on to Corporate Services Committee. I'm looking for a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Moved by Director Robinson, seconded by Director Bauer. All in favor? Anybody opposed? Motion carries. We'll go to the first item, corporate email signature for information only. CAO? Uh, yeah, this is more about branding, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, so I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Malden, and she can uh, take us through what uh, the communications group wants to do. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Malden. Thanks very much. So one aspect of our interdepartmental um, communications committee, the intercom, is to look at standardization in branding and communications. And so one of the initiatives they've been working on lately is to look at that corporate email signature and uh, look at ways to improve that. So. Uh, the lead on that initiative is Andrea Randell, so I'm going to just turn it over to her to walk the board through the proposed changes to that signature. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, Part of our branding is that we are looking at having a unified voice and um, a very uh, simple step is to have a unified signature um, in your corporate email. So um, it's just for the board's information, we will be updating the primary corporate uh, email signature and um, it will be for all staff and board members. And um, the template that we've created will be for um, uh, all of our offices. So if you're uh, the economic development office in area D, um, you'll have uh, the same kind of uh, layout. So it'll all be unified. Um, the template that we had prepared um, has been reviewed by the intercom committee and uh, the senior management team. Originally, um, the signature had a land acknowledgement uh, focused on the physical uh, location of our main office at 101 Martin Street, Penticton. Um, but we realized that uh, that wasn't really uh, going to work. Um, sorry. What's going on there? Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, please. Sorry, I'm just having some tech issues. Um, originally, our signature had a land acknowledgement um, that focused on the physical location of 101 Martin Street, where our main office is. But the work that we do is actually uh, carried out across the RDOS. So we realized that um, what we had prepared didn't really represent the entire region, um, and that the work that we do touches on several traditional territories. Um, so we've reached out to our Indigenous neighbours to work with them on an appropriate land acknowledgement. Um, I think we may have lost Andrea, if I can just jump in here. So Go ahead. Um, with respect to the land acknowledgement, um, we'll show the board what that actually looks like, but it's a, that consistent signature at the bottom um, indicating that we are acknowledging the territory upon which we conduct business. And the second uh, change to that um, proposed signature block was the acknowledgement of gender. And so this is something that you see a fair bit where beside each individual's name, there'll be an option for them to identify their gender. It can be either she, her, he, um, or they may choose to just not have anything at all there. This is something that, again, it's prevailing in um, in the world. And so we want to be able to keep current with that and reflect that same um, gender acknowledgement commitment here in the regional district. So very soon you will actually see a sample of that signature block. Um, we were going to present it today, but again, we wanted to take a little more time with the 
acknowledgement of territory and uh, make sure that we have that right because we, we want to do it right the first time. Uh, so again, as Andrea mentioned, we're working with several of our Indigenous neighbours to make sure that we do have that right. So very soon in the next week or so, you should see that proposed signature block that we have moving forward. And um, I think I'm not sure if Andrea is back or not. Uh, if so, and if there's any questions, then I suppose um, sh if she can connect in, we could answer those. Okay, thank you, Ms. Malden. Are there any questions for either Christy or Andrea on this? And I'm assuming, Ms. Malden, you'll email out to the board what that proposed signature looks like prior to us uh, starting to use it in case there's any feedback or questions. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions on this. So therefore we'll move on to the next item. Item C, the 2020 citizen survey follow-up questions, CAO. Back in 2020, we uh, had a fairly large, uh, I mean, we've been working on this for years, trying to narrow it down because uh, citizens get tired of uh, surveys these days. And we've sent out surveys since 2010, uh, starting out of our uh, organizational culture change program, where we do a staff perception survey. And then the idea was to compare results on uh, the organizational climate within uh, our organization to citizen perception of service. So we wanted a staff perception survey, and then we wanted a citizen survey uh, talking about whether they were getting good service and good value for taxes. So we were going to do the staff perception survey annually and then the citizen survey biannually. And we've been doing that since uh, 20, we did the staff perception survey initially in 2008. We did our first citizen survey in 2010 and we've been uh, determining whether there's a correlation between happy staff, happy citizen uh, relationship uh, since that time. There does seem to be uh, uh, that sort of a correlation uh, so we believe it's a good idea to, uh, from time to time, go out and ask our citizens how we are doing. So we did our last survey in 2020. And we got a lot of good information. Uh, we didn't uh, we didn't do a random sample, uh, and we didn't do a statistically correct survey in 2020 because uh, we've been finding that a lot of people nowadays don't have a landline. They operate off strictly a cell phone and it's tougher tracking that in order to get that random sample. So we did an online poll and we didn't uh, get a really robust response uh, uh, in 2020, uh, but we got a lot of good information. What we wanna do now is go back and ask some more targeted questions specifically on how people want to receive information and how we can connect with them and include them uh, in our programs. Uh, so, uh, I see that we're proposing uh, to go back out with five specific questions uh, to do another survey. We'll tie that response into the uh, information we got off of our 2020 survey, and uh, then uh, I believe it would be our intent to bring back some recommendations for service improvement uh, or response, uh, at least, uh, when we get that new information. So uh, there is a recommendation I see on the committee report, uh, Madam Chair, as to what those five questions should be. Okay, thank you, CAO. I, I believe we saw these five previously mm -hmm. as a suggestion, and I'm not sure if uh, Ms. Malden or, or you received any feedback on them. Are there any questions on these five questions? Director Gettins, go ahead, please. Thank you to the chair. It's not so much the questions. I think they're valid. I guess my concern is when we know citizens are feeling a little bit of survey fatigue, we still can't really do in-person random sampling. And that was part of the problem with the 2020 survey. We only had 223 respondents. And I think we have a lot of the answers already when we know that, you know, there's 96% of them that used email. They don't have landlines. Half don't follow the RDM on um, social media, but we've already got 60% on Civic Ready. And I'm I'm a big believer in the Civic Ready program. I think it's important, an important platform because it, I, you know, it addresses those people that also don't have, or it reaches the people that also don't have email. So I'm just a little bit concerned about putting out another survey right now. 
when we could do it again and incorporate it into a, a, maybe a larger survey without COVID to get more responses. So just more of a comment than a question, I guess. Okay, thank you, Stato. Did you have? A oh, we'll ask Ms. Malden to respond on that. I'm sure. Ms. Malden. That's a valid point. Uh, we could hold this off until 2022 and incorporate that back into the survey that we'll put out at that time uh, and continue to work on some of the comments that we did receive in on the 2021. Uh, obviously, there's areas there where we can use as launching off points to improve uh, different areas of the organization and the way that we reach out to people. So, yeah, it's either way, whatever the board would like to do, we simply could incorporate incorporate these back into the 2022 program. Okay, thank you. Director Holmes, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. I just, I'm not sure if anybody can answer this, but uh, I'm just wondering how important is it that we have a statistically accurate uh, random sampled survey as opposed to, 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 to some, um, what was in here? And, um, if if that's if that's important for us, is it possible? I understand the difficulty with phones these days, but is it possible to do it by snail mail, considering everybody still has a street address? Miss Mullen, it's entirely possible to do it with mail. It's a, um, there's ser several different ways that we could do that, and reach out to people, um, specific people within each area. Again, we could use things like Civic Ready and, and and you know our Facebook and all of that to have them call us, reach out to us as well and become part of that panel group. We've talked about that in the past. Uh, we didn't explore that at this point, uh, but that yeah. certainly is an option. And I wonder if Eric has any more to add to that. To the chair? Uh, yes, yeah, go ahead. I think, thank you. There are a couple of options that we do have, and, and to Director Gettin's point, um, that is very valid that we, we don't want to prematurely go out and ask questions again. The idea was to really focus in and follow up on what we've heard with hopefully uh, a larger audience taking part and to make it more uh, statistically valid. The types of things we could do would be uh, mail outs that are, are not necessarily to the entire area because that, that would be quite expensive and it's a lot of people. Uh, making hard copies available at some of the municipal offices might be an option, but of course with COVID it's so challenging. Um, there is an option to ask people um, who would like a hard copy uh, for, for us to mail, the RDOS to mail a copy to them. Um, so there, there are a bunch of options we're looking at to, to get a larger, uh, more feedback from a larger group. And the feedback is really important because especially with COVID going on right now, we're finding the types of feedback we get from people on how they receive information is evolving and it seems to be evolving by the month. And an example would be the APEX referendum that just took place. We had an exit survey. We didn't receive a lot of comments, but half of the comments people said, I felt I had enough information. The other half people said they would have liked to have information mailed directly to their homes. That can be expensive and it's not always practical, but if that's what people are saying, that's what residents, citizens of the area are saying, we have to take that into consideration at the RDOS. Another important uh, factor that is um, challenging with communications is that there are so many people in the Okanagan who don't necessarily live here full time. They own property here. They come here on occasion or, or uh, throughout the year, but um, reach them if they live in a different area can also be challenging. So part of what we're trying to determine right now is um, how people would like to receive information. So by asking those five questions, what we had hoped to do uh, within communications was to really um, invite a larger group to participate because it's such a quick survey, it's, it's, it's fairly easy to do. And we could again, randomly invite people to uh, participate so that we get a more scientifically statistical, statistically correct data. Sure. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna go to CAO. Uh, just to Director Holmes' uh, question, Madam Chair. So, from a quantitative measures point of view, uh, sure, the statistically correct survey uh, would be much stronger, and that's uh, that's what we have done in the past. Uh, it's only the 2020 survey uh, that we didn't do the statistically uh, correct uh, formula for identifying a random sample and then getting that 95% confidence level that it would represent the viewpoint of the whole regional district. Uh, in the past, uh, we haven't gone uh, 
typically, if you do a mail out, you mail out to everybody. So you do you try and capture 100% uh, of the people in the uh, target area. And you uh, st statistics would say you'll get a 15% response uh, normally. So uh, not, in my mind, the best uh, methodology. Uh, the other way that, and the way that we've used in the past has been the telephone survey where uh, you hire professional survey. Our, our statistically correct survey number is just over 400. So uh, you'd hire a survey firm uh, to randomly select uh, 400 people across uh, the regional district. And then they just keep phoning until they get that 400 uh, from the uh, specific area to make it statistically correct so that uh, you can get a 95% confidence that those uh, responses uh, accurately reflect the viewpoints of the whole regional district. Um, we went away and, uh, I mean, there's weaknesses in that obviously now with uh, a, a large uh, amount of people who don't have landlines, you're not going to get that um, constituent, the ones that don't live here but own property here, you're not going to get that constituent. Uh, so where we went this year was we just, uh, in 2020, we put it out as a rolling poll, more or less, on the RDOS webpage. And then those that were interested uh, responded. So uh, uh, not that either way is wrong. It's just you get, a diff I think you'd get a different perspective depending on which methodology you chose. It costs very little to do the, sort of the rolling poll on the web page. It can cost a lot to do a statistically uh, uh, correct uh, survey. So that was another factor in the decision model this year is that we weren't sure about the results. Uh, we didn't want to spend a whole bunch of money and we thought we would get uh, valid uh, information from those that wanted to comment uh, through that rolling poll. Uh, so, uh, something we can always, before we do another one, we'll certainly come back to the board and, and uh, get viewpoints on what we do in the future. It's just that this is what we did for 2020. Okay, thank you. Director Monteith, go ahead. To the chair, I, I am hearing from my community that the survey was a bit flawed. The uh, survey wasn't able to be completed on um, a tablet or a phone. Um, seniors felt the survey was just way too much um, and they felt that it just it took too much time to go through it all. They did prefer a, a printed copy. I did send people into the um, 101 Martin office to pick up copies. I don't know if they did or not, but I mean, it kind of brought up points of having those printed surveys maybe available in communities for people to pick up if that's what they want to do or, you know, opportunities like um, using a link to be emailed out through different community organizations. Every community has got a homeowners association or, or something that we could have communicated better with them versus trying to just do it solely on their own. I'm concerned that we didn't get enough information to make um, decisions. 200 response out of the number of residents within our electoral areas is not enough to make any decisions. So I, I do want more information. And I think that if we ask information from our residents, we can make better decisions. So I would like to see us proceed with a shorter survey, more condensed, and make it available and utilize all our homeowners associations and our community groups to be able to get as many residents as possible to get their feedback. Okay, thank you. Um, Director Roberts, you're next, and we're still looking for a motion. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you to the chair. Um, first off, I'll make that motion. So the motion that was in the administrative report? Yes. Okay, and Director Pendergraph, I believe you were seconding. Correct, thank you. We have the motion on the floor. Go ahead, Director Roberts. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, this is a bit of a question because again, uh, as the OCP committee is started up in area G and we're using you know, whether or not it's civic ready and I've seen, you know, just received some of the little um, hard stock that's, you know, directing people to other places for information. And I've been directing people to go to the RDUS connections. And uh, my question would be for Mr. Thompson, 
uh, is there a way and are you able to see the interaction that's happening on each project that's on the RDUS uh, connection site to be able to see the impact uh, when people are turning up on that? Just, uh, I'm just really interested in as we move forward in the OCP process, um, I, I'm uh, pretty excited about uh, this new service. Mr. Thompson? To the chair, yes, Director Roberts, uh, we do monitor in the communications resource, we do monitor uh, RDOS regional connections and uh, there are a number of projects on there right now and there is a Q&A section, so we have access to that information and uh, that's a really good resource to be able to go back and forth with people to provide answers. But again, it is digital only. And that's the real challenge that I find keeps coming up is how are we communicating with residents who either don't have Internet access or just don't have the type of Internet access that would make it uh, conducive to even having a meeting like this or to filling out a survey. And as was pointed out earlier, using different devices always going back to hard copies and uh, non-digital forms of communication i think is something we, we as a regional district need to look at it's challenging especially because of course we've been dealing with this covid uh, situation for the last year so inviting people to come into offices to pick up hard copies and those types of things probably not the best idea especially right now but uh, offering to mail it to them or making it available in the communities where they can pick it up and not have to necessarily interact with staff i think that's really where we have to look at. And um, to your point, uh, Director Roberts, uh, through the chair, uh, absolutely, we're monitoring RDOS regional connections to see the type of feedback that's coming in on a variety of topics. Long answer for a short question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any further questions or comments? Director Monteith, is that a leftover hand? Yep. Yeah. okay. Thank you. We do have a motion on the floor to proceed with the survey questions. I'm not seeing any other hands up and therefore going to call the question on the motion. All in favor? Thank you. Hands can come down. And was anybody opposed? Director Gettens opposed. Anybody else? Not seeing any. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Looking for a motion to adjourn Corporate Services Committee. Moved by Director Sentis, seconded by Director Bauer. All in favor? Thank you. Anybody opposed? Okay, we are adjourned. And folks, we have the board meeting coming up very shortly. Um, let's take a 10 minute break, grab a bite, and we'll start at 11.20 a.m. Thank you very much.
Okay, good morning, directors. We're going to get started with the regular board meeting. Have a look at your agendas. If anybody would like something removed from the consent agenda, now's the time. It's your only opportunity to do so. Having a look, I'm not seeing anybody with a hand up for consent agenda. Therefore, I'm looking for a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Moved by Director Bush, seconded by Director Pendergraft. Call the question, all in favor? Thank you, anybody opposed? Okay, and now I'm looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda of corporate issues. Moved by Director Bush, seconded by Director Pendergraft. All in favor? Anybody opposed? Motion carries, and I'm looking for a motion to approve consent agenda development services. Moved by Director Bush, seconded by Director Bob Coyne. Call the question, all in favor? Anybody opposed? Motion carries. So that takes us down to B, development services, rural land use matters, B1, 2021 regional housing needs assessment, CAO. Thanks, Madam Chair. So this is directly out of our planning development committee this morning. And uh, the board then is aware that this is a regulatory requirement that local governments uh, receive our regional uh, housing needs assessment. So in order to meet that requirement, uh, we're recommending that uh, the board do receive it and that we use it as sort of a guiding document for our OCP and zoning bylaw discussions in the future. Thank you. Uh, looking for a motion to receive the housing needs assessment, moved by Director Trainer, seconded by Director Sentis. Any questions or comments? Okay, not seeing any. I'm going to call the question. All in favor? And is anybody opposed? Motion carries. We'll go down to B2, Agricultural Land Commission referral, non-adhering residential use, 5475 Sumac Street in Electoral Area C, CAO. Uh, this is farm worker accommodation, Madam Chair, and it is inconsistent with the uh, Area C official community plan and zoning bylaw, so we're recommending that it not be authorized to proceed. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to Director Canova. Are you there, Director Canole? Where do you go? Uh, Danny, do you know if we have connection with Director Canole? Uh, yeah, just no video and no odd like this. If you're there, Director Canole, you are on mute. I don't see him on video. I wonder if he's back from lunch. Um, okay, well, we could get somebody else to help him. Um, no, he, he may want to recommend the alternative, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, I would hold on this one. Okay, well, what we're going to do is we're just going to hold on this one uh, in case Director Canola needs a bit more time to get back from break. We'll move on then to B3, Agricultural Land Commission Referral, Non-Adhering Residential Use at 379 Linden Avenue in Area I, CAO. So this is for a larger than normal uh, residence, uh, Madam Chair. So uh, this, uh, uh, the, the restriction in Area I is 500 square meters uh, for uh, primary residence, and this one is larger than that, uh, but never, nevertheless, it is uh, concurrent with the density regulations in the zoning bylaw, so we're recommending that it be authorized to proceed to the Agricultural Land Commission. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to Director Monteith. And I'd like to make the administrative recommendation, please. Okay, thank you. I see it's seconded by Director Pendergraft. Any questions on this? Okay, I'm going to call the question then. All in favor? Thank you. Hands can come down. And was anybody opposed? Motion carries. We'll go down to B4. 
Development Variance Permit Application 363 Pineview Drive in Area I, CAO. So this is for a garage deck uh, addition, Madam Chair. So they need a, a rear yard uh, setback uh, variance uh, from 7.5 to 2.2 meters. And uh, we believe this may be an imposition on the neighbor. So we're recommending that the uh, application be denied. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Director Monteith. And I'd like to make the alternate recommendation to approve this variance. Okay. Is there a seconder for that? Director Robinson, thank you. Uh, actually, I think, uh, Ms. Malden, we need a seconder to be rural. Is that correct, being a rural vote? You do. I do. Okay. For four. It's a rural oh, vote. Item four? A DVP? Yes. yes, that is a rural vote, so we do require okay. a rural director. Thank you. So we've got Director uh, Gettins is seconding that. Thank you. Oh, uh, sorry, Director Monteith, you have your hand up. Go ahead, please. Yes, to the chair. I just want to share that the neighbor does support the addition. That it, just based on the topography of Caledon, um, it, it's an imposing on the neighbor and it fits the neighborhood and it fits the community at that location. So I do support it for those reasons. And it does the, the build around their home, doesn't create a larger footprint. I mean, it makes sense. So I do support it. Okay, thank you. And I see we did get a letter of support from the neighbor, and I believe the APC also supported this. Okay, so we have a, a motion for approval on the floor. Any further questions or comments? I'll call the question then. All in favor? Anybody opposed? Motion carries, thank you. I see we've got Director Canodal back, so we're gonna go back to B2. Agricultural Land Commission referral, non-adhering residential use, 5475 Sumac Street in Electoral Area C. CAO, did you wanna to speak to that one again? Uh, no, just uh, for Director Canodal's uh, interest, and we're administratively recommending that it not be authorized, uh, just because it is inconsistent with the Area C OCP and zoning bylaw. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Director Canodal on this. Thank you. This is uh, again one of the, the similar uh, uh, farm labor uh, temporary housing units. Uh, it's actually going to replace a house that's currently on the site, so it doesn't change the footprint. Uh, they've decided that the house is not of any value, not worth uh, uh, replace uh, re repairing. So they're going to remove the house, put the camp. Uh, building on that site. So uh, the APC is recommended it in favor of it. It's consistent with, with what we've been doing to this point. So I'm going to recommend the alternate uh, that we approve to go on to the ALC. Thank you. Okay, is there a seconder? Director Bush, you're seconding that? Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments on this one? Okay, I'm going to call the question then. All in favor? Thank you. Hands can come down. And is anybody opposed? Motion carries. Now we'll go to B5. Postponement of an official community plan bylaw amendment application 1750 Highway 3 in Electoral Area A, CAO. Uh, this is a, an amendment to uh, change a large holdings lot to small holdings, Madam Chair, for a six lot subdivision. Uh, because we're in the process of uh, repealing the existing bylaw that this would amend, uh, we're proposing that this be deferred until the Area A official community plan that's currently in progress be adopted, and then this could come forward. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Director Pendergraft. I'll make that recommendation, please. Okay, thank you. Seconded by Director Bush. Any questions or concerns? This one's a rural vote. Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. 
We'll go down to B6, Zoning Bylaw Amendment 8475 Princeton Summerland Road in Area F, CAO. This is for the uh, processing of a two lot subdivision, uh, Madam Chair. We're recommending that the Area F zoning bylaw be amended uh, and that we give it first and second reading and we bring it before the board on May 6th for a public hearing. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Director Gettins. Yeah, I'd like to make the recommendation, please. Okay, thank you. Seconded by Director Roberts. Any questions or comments? This is a rural vote. Call the question, all in favor? Hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. We'll go to B7, Zoning Bylaw Amendment, Electoral Area, D, E, F, and I, Regulation of Solar Energy Systems, CAO. Uh, this is the outcome of our discussions at committee over the past few meetings, Madam Chair, and uh, we're recommending that this get first and second reading and proceed to public hearing on May 6th before the Board of Directors. Okay, thank you. Looking for a motion to approve this. Um, Director Roberts is moving it. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Looking for a rural seconder. Director Pendergraf, thank you very much. Any questions or comments? A rural vote. Oh, Director Bob Coyne, you have a question? Go ahead, please. Is this a participant vote? No, it's a rural vote. So all, all nine. Thank you. Uh, Director Gettins, do you have a question? Thank you. Yes, yeah, the chair. I just, I'm sure that staff looked into this, but I was looking these up online and the height restriction that we're putting on at 1.2 meters, I can't find a ground mounted solar panel that's under that when you incorporate the tilt. And so I just wanted to make sure that that was addressed somewhere that staff looked into that. Thanks. Uh, so is the question, I think the 1.2 matches the height of uh, fencing. Is that correct, CAO? That would seem to make sense. So I believe if you're asking um, what you're asking, Director Gettins, is if, if it's over the 1.2, that's where we would have a restriction. Can't imagine there's one under 1.2, but never know what the technology mm -hmm. is out there. So is that what you're looking for, confirmation that if it's over 1.2, um, I guess what, yeah, what I guess I'm looking for confirmation on is that if we have ground mounted solar systems that are less than 1.2 meters in height, because we're using the height of our fence as a guideline, it makes sense, except that can, are there any ground mounted solar systems available that are 1.2 meters high? Or if anybody wants to put one on, do they have to keep getting a variance? Uh, have we got Mr. Garish on the line? I'm going to look to see if Chris is on the line. Mm. Corey's on the line. Corey, are you able to answer that question? Is Chris on? Oh, there's Chris. Oh, Chris, your last name is spelled as Garish Good. <laughs> but we all know who you are. So go ahead, please. Not hearing audio though. One minute. Is Rushi going to run down the hall? <laughs> yeah, okay. He's going to join us. Welcome, Rushi. Go Hi. ahead, please. Uh, to chair, yeah, there are certain uh, solar energy systems that are less than uh, ground mounted solar energy systems that are less than 1.2 meters in height. Mm. Yeah. That's excellent to know. Thank yeah. you. Uh, anything further there, Director Gittins? Yeah, just really quickly then. So if it's less than 1.2 meters in height, but then they have the tilt, is the tilt part of that 1.2 meters? I don't, I don't mean to nitpick. I just want to make sure that we're encouraging people to move to solar if they want to and i can't like i said i can't find it. i can see that the, at the top they're three feet high but then when they tilt to the sun we add another foot or two depending on that tilt 
I just want to make sure that this is encouraging people to use solar panels in a way that makes sense. Um, to the chair, yeah. Uh, so even uh, we are measuring height from the base of the ground or a finished grid to the topmost part of that uh, of that tilt. So uh, in talking to consultants or uh, Swiss solar techs who already construct these uh, solar energy devices all over the uh, Okanagan, uh, we concluded that 1.2 meter is a height that could be referenced and uh, there are available alternatives that they can do uh, up to measure it up all, only up until 1.2 meters. So it could be done. Yeah, and, and that would be still encouraging the community to opt for ground mounted systems. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that information. Any further questions or comments? We have the motion on the floor. It's a rural vote. Call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Hands could come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. We'll move on to B8, Zoning Bylaw Amendment, Unit 102 and 103, 850 Railway Lane in Area D, CAO. Thank you, Mr. Kim. Rishi? Yeah. Oh, yeah, if you are, just move six feet away from me. <laughs> Get away, he said. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. So these are the condos at the bottom of Waterman's Hill in Okanagan Falls, moving them uh, from commercial to residential so they can build those five residential units uh, in uh, unoccupied space. So we're recommending that this be adopted, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to Director Obrick. Yes, thank you to the Chair. And I'd like to move the administrative recommendation, please. Thank you. I'm being seconded by Director Roberts. Any questions or comments? This is a rural vote. I'll call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Hands can come down. And is anybody opposed? Motion carries. We'll go down to B9, Amendment of the Development Procedures Bylaw Number 2500-2011, CAO. Yeah, this is the one that uh, changes the rule with regards to uh, uh, individual directors sending uh, DVPs out to their APCs. Uh, now it's going to require them to come to the board and then the board would address them. So we're recommending adoption on that, I'm sure. Okay, thank you. I'm looking for a mover. Director Pendergraf is moving this. Is there a seconder? Director Bob Coyne, thank you. Any questions or comments? It's a rural vote. I'll call the question. All in favor? Hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Director Monteith, you're opposed. Anybody else opposed? Thank you. Motion carries. We'll go down to C, Public Works, C1, RDOS Administered Landfills Regulatory Bylaw, CAO. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. So uh, we have, um, so is this for landfills or for collection? Anyway, this is the uh, landfills regulatory bylaw, Madam Chair, and uh, it's mostly housekeeping. It's like a, a changing in definitions and uh, upgrading uh, to current standards. So we're recommending that this be given first, second, third readings and adoption. Thank you. And this one is a participant vote with a two thirds majority required. So looking for a mover for this one. Director Bush is moving it. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Director Monti, thank you. Any questions or comments on this? Just so everybody knows, the participants are areas B, C, D, E, F, G, and I, as well as Kiramias, Oliver, and Penticton. I'm going to call the question. All in favor? Okay, thank you. Hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Okay, motion carries. We'll go down to D, Community Services, D1, Ecom 911 Service Contract Extension, CAO. Yeah, so uh, the regional district. Uh, um, partners with many other regional districts for the E911 service and it's administered by the Central Okanagan Regional District. Uh, we had been in a 
uh, five-year agreement with uh, a, a provider down on the coast. And that agreement expired about a year and a half ago. And uh, they are currently in the process of negotiating the next generation of E91 uh, dispatch. So this is basically cell phone technology. And that is not yet uh, concluded. So we did give an extension uh, to this contract previously, and they're asking for another one. We believe they're getting close, uh, but it's just not ready yet, and the extension has expired. So we're recommending that we authorize uh, this agreement extension, uh, Madam Chair, to expire at the end of this calendar year, so December 31st, 2021. And uh, in addition to that, uh, because uh, Central Okanagan administers it, uh, we have to just remind uh, MIA that uh, we're protecting them if there's any negligence on our part and that uh, we extend them as an associate member on our uh, MIA BC policy so that they don't get the expense for that. So we're recommending that we go ahead and do those three things, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Looking for a mover. Director Roberts is moving this. Thank you. And Director Getton seconding. Are there any questions or concerns? This is a weighted corporate vote. Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. We'll go to D2, Manitou Park Pathway Award of Contract, CAO. So we're recommending that this contract be awarded to Shoot Creek Construction uh, for $71,870, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Looking for a mover for this. Director Bob Coyne and seconded by Director Census. Any questions or concerns? This is a weighted corporate vote. Call the question, all in favor? Anybody opposed? Motion carries. I think uh, Director Roberts, were you opposed? Nope. Okay, thank you. Motion carries. We'll go to E Legislative Services, E1, Board Procedure Bylaw, CAO. Yeah, so uh, we've had a number of discussions about the procedure bylaw. Our are reverting back to our legislative workshop in November and at some committees uh, since. So we've gathered those up now and uh, we're recommending that the board do go ahead and make these uh, amendments, Madam Chair, uh, which are outlined in the report. So we're recommending that this bylaw get first, second, third reading and be adopted. Thank you. Looking for a mover, Director Roberts is moving this. Is there a seconder? Looking for a seconder. Director Bob Coyne, thank you. Any questions? This is a corporate vote requiring a two thirds majority. All the question, all in favor? Thank you, hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Director Holmes opposed? Anybody else opposed? Motion carries. Takes us down to FCAO report. Anything? Just a couple things, Madam Chair. Uh, there was a, a, a notice that came out from the province about the immunization rollout and that uh, starting in April, frontline priority workers uh, could receive doses. So uh, we've had questions coming in from our fire departments about when uh, they may be able to register for that. And in discussions uh, with the provinces recently as uh, yesterday, uh, they have told us that um, fire departments or uh, firefighters or first responders should not be contacting them directly, that they'll be rolling this out through employers. And it's more or less a uh, 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 don't call us, we'll call you sort of arrangement. So when they're ready to roll that uh, a list of workers out, they'll contact us and then we'll set up uh, the appointments for vaccinations. So 
Uh, if you if directors are getting those calls from their fire departments, uh, they can pass that along. We've sent out a notice to them, um, but uh, everybody's anxious for their vaccination, so uh, they're still calling. Okay. Anything further? Uh, oh, um, we had the housing uh, report today. Uh, there is another one that we started on back. Uh, in 2020 as well, and that was a child care planning study, uh, which we've partnered with a number of our member municipalities on. That is coming, I believe, on April 15th. So just a heads up on that. And then uh, uh, also there's been a discussion lately about the West Bench Geotechnical Report. Uh, that is uh, in draft form, ready to come. Uh, we have uh, uh, some disagreement with some of the recommendations on there that we need clarification on. So. Uh, we're currently preparing our administrative response on that, and that will be uh, before the board uh, shortly. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, Chair's report. I don't have anything new to report other than uh, still participating in the SILGA lecture series. I know some of our board members are participating in that. So we have another one uh, next week again on Wednesday. That's um, the last in the series at 12 p.m. and that's with, um, it's called the role of universities in regional recovery with TRU president, Dr. Brett Fairbairn. Fair, Fair so that's the last in our series. So for those of you who have been participating, hopefully you'll, you'll be able to attend that next week as well. Okay, and that takes us down to uh, G2 director's motions. So first, um, I'm not sure if there's going to be any notice of motions, but first up, we're going to go to Director Obrick's motion. That motion is on the floor, so we want to proceed with that one first. So it's already on the floor from last meeting. If there are any questions or comments, please raise your hand. Director Obrick, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, and thank you very much. Um, the uh, I think everybody has probably received a tremendous amount of respondents from concerned community members, uh, so many letters, uh, quite interesting. Uh, I can say that I did not solicit, write, or, or ask for a single letter, whether it was from Mr. Angie's or from others in the community. A lot of the letters, I, I don't think I've, if I've met these people or, or have ever talked to them, I don't even remember. About half the letters, uh, I, I do know the people and I've met them. Uh, some of them, it, I just want to read out a, a couple to express the community concern. This one, it says, I'm writing to express my dismay that this park is being named for a family who I have never heard of after being a homeowner in Heritage Hills for 25 years. This is expressly against the wishes of local residents who have contributed much time and money to the project. Perhaps we should rename the RDOS something like RDTDL, regional district that does not listen. Um, Dr. Chris Tonoff, I don't know the doctor, 25 years in the community, but it, it speaks to us as a board when the community has such a strong reaction. I, I think we need to listen Another one, and then this will be the last one I read, it said, it, and I just find these fascinating. It has come to my attention that the park that our community has worked on has somehow been named Garnett Family Park. I'm not sure why the name was chosen, but it does not make any sense. The two original names were adequate, and I have further suggestions. The entire hill was once owned by Gordon Wilkins, who was once a Reeve in Penticton. The Hill was his apricot orchard, my house, which was built by him, he called Tumble Moon, and it was built in 1929. It was the first house to be built in this area, so perhaps we should name the park after him or Tumble Moon. The suggestions being Wilkins Park, Tumble Moon Park is another. Uh, I've had um, members of the Parks and Rec Commission uh, take care to send me copies of our procedure bylaw. They direct me to paragraph 8.1. All commissions shall be advisory to the board, shall be authorized to make recommendations and provide advice 
to the board the organization and conduct of a parks and recreation program in accordance with the budget approved by the board including planning development and implementation of parks and recreation services the the issue here is about respect respect for the law obeying the law following the law and this matter goes back to October 18 well it has a very long history but October 18 2018 I wasn't elected I was at the boardroom when I decided to run uh, I did not have the good sense to go to a board meeting first I made the mistake of deciding to run before I'd gone to a board meeting and I went to four board meetings before I was elected uh, Director Monteith was there. She witnessed the same things I did in those four meetings. I think she'd been there many months uh, studying hard as she always does. And I, I was there October 18th and I watched the debate, a board motion made uh, with respect to something brought forth with staff recommendation. I recall the debate well. I remember the vote. I remember Director uh, Conance, as she then was, saying, are you telling me that the the statement in the staff report is not true and there were representations in that report that were not true and I recall director Sidden saying yes they're not true and she repeated the question and he repeated the answer there was discussion debate and the board motion was made and 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 and, and uh, I was there I watched one of our staff uh, get up from the delegation table shaking with upset and I spoke to him and and, and we had a talk and he indicated that the information that was not accurate came to him from uh, the developer. And, and I, I asked him, why didn't you talk to the Parks and Rec Commission? Why didn't you talk to the community, confirm the accuracy? But he, but he did not. He, I think we could say that was not a best practice. And then I was elected. And then the matter, uh, the motion of October 18 was sent to the community. The, the Parks and Rec Commission was asked by this board to do, to do something. They did it in good faith, and so did the community. And it came back on June 6, 2019, and I spoke to it. Now, this is after threats were made and, and meetings were had. The developer would not participate, would not participate in the, in the process. And, and the community still gave consideration to his position and made a recommendation. And, uh, and, and this was brought to the board, not, not by me, but by threat of the developer who went and, and asked for it to be put on the agenda and he was successful. And then we end up with uh, a vote on June 6 of this board. Uh, a, a vote which was not respected by the developer, not followed uh, by staff. I asked for help. I asked for engage. I said, I don't support either name. We have a we need to resolve it. We need to listen. And then somehow it got back on the board agenda for September 5th. And I think September 5th, 2019, it looks to me like it was out of order. Uh, now, I didn't know it was out of order. I spoke that day a little bit. Uh, the chair recall, I was told, Director Obrick, you've spoken twice. You're not allowed to talk anymore. Uh, they, we, we, we parted from our normal protocol. I didn't make the motions. They went to other directors who made motions. The community was upset. Oh, my gosh. And November 7th. Uh, when uh, our legislative service manager was reviewing our policy and process, we were told that they can't bring a matter back uh, less than a year. And of course, I put the question, uh, can you bring it back if you change one name and change the order of two words? She said no. And I asked, well, how do you explain the September 5th motion coming back to us on the Heritage Hills Park matter? And she didn't answer. And, 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 and the CAO, I think, in complete good faith, tried to help. He, he interrupted and said that was different. That was a, a motion of reconsideration. Now, we all know, and, and no one better than Director Vasilaki, that's not, that's not a proper reconsideration motion. But we end up with the matter being referred back to the Park and Rec Commission in November of 2020 by staff. I was at the meeting. The commission members said, are you serious? You really want to know what we think? And the staff said, yes, that's why we're asking. And so a letter of concern and motions were made. The letter of concern came to the chair. I didn't write the letter. I didn't send the letter for reasons I don't understand. And, and I accept there was a misunderstanding, a miscommunication. The letter went 
Uh, it took four, four, four months and one week to be delivered to the board members to whom it was addressed. Um, the letters arrived. I, I know the board has, has I'm sure, reviewed the, all the correspondence, all the concerns. And I think what this does, and I've received uh, hostile calls uh, from the developer making threats, uh, which I won't repeat now, but if we need to, we can go into closed session. I'll gladly re review those threats with all of you. But I think the business today, uh, and I'm asking that we respect the law, we obey the law, we, we give oversight, which is part of our role, some consideration here. And I, I, I made the motion, which is the staff recommendation, which I support. Take it to the committee, have a proper look, have a proper discussion. Today's not the day for that. Let's, let's listen, let's hear with an open mind. And let's not prejudge, let's go through good process and give the all the members uh, who are concerned about this the respect they deserve uh, by listening this is not a common practice in this board i don't think we have a habit of of uh, people bringing concerns of this magnitude forward i think that reflects well on 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 everyone but when it's brought forth this way uh, i think we have an opportunity and and I think a duty and obligation. So uh, those are my comments. I just wanted to uh, follow up from the last meeting because we've had a couple weeks to to reflect on this. And uh, thank you very much to for listening to me. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Director Monteith, go ahead, please. To the chair. I've done a lot of research and, and communication and talking to people and, and director of work as well, trying to find some of the history. I just want to kind of share things that I have found. So I know that when land, when a subdivision occurs, that we go through a subdivision process. Typically it's land or money. I understand in this subdivision that money was accepted. That's typical. So then I understand that there was also a tax receipt issued for the Interesting. I, I don't know if that's typical, but I also know the community is also looking at at least they're currently leasing the land part of the park and they're leasing it for 20 years with the option to purchase it. So that kind of brings the community as well as the developer together on this park, in my opinion. And I, I also see that this is a unique situation and I, I don't know of another park in our areas that are in that situation. So. I'm wondering if, as a board, I, I, I just don't see it as a cut and dry situation. And I feel that, yes, the developer does have some naming options and consideration, but with the community purchasing it too, I think they need, and they're expressing that they need to be involved in the process. So I do support Director Oberick in this because there is a collaboration, and I see it as collaboration, and I see it as a board that maybe we can find a middle ground somewhere. And I, and I don't feel that we're there yet. So I do support Director Ulrich bringing this back to committee and seeing what we can do as a collaboration versus just a typical, because this is not a typical situation. Okay, thank you. CIO, did you have any clarification on that from a subdivision standpoint? Uh, in my mind, this is a motion to defer, Madam Chair, which wouldn't typically be debated. It is not a motion to defer. It's to defer to committee. Oh, to refer out to committee, yes. Yeah. Okay. So it would have a more detailed discussion there. I didn't prepare saying. anything for yes. this meeting. Okay. I just thought we might clarify the point of if yes, when there's a subdivision that's cash or or land, but this my understanding is this went beyond the typical. Um and that might be what you're saying, Director Monte. Okay, I'll go to Director McCordoff next, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Well, I do appreciate the discussion and I've been reading some of the letters. The motion today uh, asks to refer the discussion on a proposed name change for the Garnet Family Park to the next Community Services Committee. So it seems to me that that would be the appropriate place to bring all of these letters forward and have the discussion. And I don't think today is a good time to do that. We can either move, uh, go ahead with this uh, motion or not. 
Um, so I, I think we need to ask for the for the motion and a vote on it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Director Holmes, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you. I, I'm I'm struggling a little bit with this one uh, because uh, you know on the one hand uh, the the discussion has been had and I didn't necessarily agree with the decision at the time but the discussion has been had and um, so what I'm trying to wrap my head around is has any new information or is anything different come forward since the last time we discussed it or not. And if it if there if there is new information, which I'm struggling to figure out what that is, um, then I, I'd be happy to 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 refer it back to committee. But if not, then I don't really see the point. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Director Monteith. I think you have a leftover hand up. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else with a comment uh, or suggestion? Director Bob Coin, go ahead, please. Mm -hmm. I agree with uh, Director Holmes on this one here. Uh, we beat this around the bush for a long, long time. We made a decision and Director Obrick talks about respect. Well, then let's respect the decision that the board made. Mm -hmm. Let's carry yes. on with life. This is the way it was done. And as far as I'm concerned, it's over and done with. So let's let's just carry on. Thank you. Thank you, Director Overt. Go ahead. Uh, yes, and thank you to the chair. And just speaking to Director Holmes' question, and first to Director Coins, uh, I, I just uh, agree with Director Coin fully that we need to be respectful always of the law, and we should obey the law, and we should follow the law. And to answer Director Holmes, uh, there, there's two two answers to your question, and and both relevant and important and 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 I appreciate your your point about new information and I think that's key uh, indeed that's a basic principle of law and I could speak for for hours on on how it's done in the courts and, and, and the Harris decision Supreme Court of Canada that articulates the particulars as to the importance uh, when it comes to legal matters even when you have raised judicata even when you have murder convictions are being overturned. I can tell you how that's done. But with respect to this specific matter, uh, we have two things. One, uh, I'm not satisfied that the board was aware on September 5th that legal process may not have been in good order, but that's different and new information. It was for me on November 7. I can't speak for the rest of the board, but, but I didn't know that we may well have been uh, out of uh, legal order, legal process, and that's a that's a question worth uh, examining and getting some good answers for this board before you make your judgment on whether you want to hear this uh, concern expressed by the Parks and Rec Commission and others. But but number two, uh, there there is a great deal of information that was not put to this board uh, on on uh, the uh, previous occasion of. Uh, September 5th, and indeed, uh, uh, not not so much on June 6th or October 18th either. And that information uh, is relevant, is material. There's no harm done giving this concern the attention of this board in a committee meeting in the future. We have the time. Uh, we certainly have the ability, and I would suggest we have the responsibility and the obligation under the law. So I'm just asking that there be some to the law that we obey the law and, and we apply good process. Uh, I am not prejudging this. I don't know where it's going to go. And I'd ask other directors to join me and not prejudge. Just just let process have a chance. Let the words uh, be, be, be considered today is not the time for that. That's why the staff recommendation, I think, is the right one. I support it. And I would ask the rest of you to join uh -huh. us. Not and, and thank you. I, I've said enough. I'm sure I, I'm I'll say goodbye. Thank you. Hey, thank you. I just want to clarify that's not a staff recommendation. This is just the director's motion. Staff weren't involved in what's written here. Um, it, right, it, excuse motion. me, but if I can clarify, I did ask for assistance from staff on March 4th with uh, with direction and the March uh, 18 minutes. It was uh, recommended and it certainly wasn't written by me. 
but I do appreciate assistance from staff. And if it's not a staff recommendation, my apologies to anybody I may have offended by misunderstanding both my question and ask for help and the response to that help. Thank you. Thank you. So just to clarify, it's, it's a motion, which means that this was a motion of Director Obricks that the board uh, approved, even though staff may assist, it's, it's not a, a staff's motion here. Um, I'd like to just clarify a few things. In my opinion, just me, I felt that the, the new name that came forward did follow correct process. Mr. Anches had, pro Anches had proposed a name that wasn't um, something that the board accepted. Then he made a name change. He removed the first name of uh, Mr. Garnett. He took Ted out. He thought that that might be more accepting of the board to not have it be such a personal name by saying Ted Garnett. So he did propose that name change. He brought that forward. So in my opinion, that fit with procedure because it was a change to the name. Um, I'm sure people have different opinions on whether they felt that fit or not. Um, and I would like to say, uh, caution uh, directors on what we are reading with letters that are sent in. Um, there are, I do feel there's some misinformation and I find that frustrating. Um, you know, there's a letter that was written back at, during this time in uh, November 2019 by one of the directors with the uh, Heritage Hills Community Association. And he stated that only one member of the board, of the 19 of us, Director Vasilaki knew who Ted Garnett was. That's not true. So I don't know why someone would write representing the board, but I know who Ted Garnett is. I know the Garnett family for 35, 40 years. So I don't know why someone would write that, but I just caution that often what we're reading may have some misinformation in it. So just keep that in mind when you're reading different letters to the editor or letters that come to us that sometimes there's, and, and there's a, been a few others, but I don't want to get into that now. So um, we have the motion on the floor. I'm not seeing any other hands up at this time. Uh, Director Obrick, you're coming back again. Third time. Yeah, Go thank ahead. you. And yeah, thank you. And I just wanted to say that I've been on the receiving end of a lot of misinformation. I've had uh, things said about me that aren't accurate, and I, I sure do appreciate the chair's clarification. I've seen things said by uh, 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 the the uh, you know, Mr. Angie's in this case that's not accurate as well. So I'm I, I do appreciate that the accuracy. Uh, there, there's a, I think a live issue here. It's one well worth, uh, having the board look at properly rather than shutting the door and saying, we're not interested. I, I think we should be interested in those details and, and take the time to sort it out. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Director Gens, go ahead, please. Thank you to the chair. Um, I'm going to support this motion because when I read the letters, I was surprised at how many letters were laid that they didn't know where the name came from or that the board um, gave the name. Like they didn't understand. I thought there was a lack of understanding of how this all happened and what the process is with the developer. And I think that it's obviously an important issue to the community. I think we do have time at community services to listen to this. I did ask um, staff for a little bit of clarification as well. and. I just, I think it's worth another conversation. I think we've got that time. Okay, thank you. I believe Director Obrick, that's left over hand on the screen. Yes, okay. Uh, anybody else with a comment? Okay, so the motion is on the floor and I'm gonna read that out, that the Board of Directors refer discussion on proposed name change for the Garnett Family Park to the next Community Services Committee. I'm going to call the question then. All in favor? Okay. Thank you. Hands can come down. Just make sure the screen clears. Okay. And those opposed? Keep your hands up so we can record this. Director Bob Coyne, Director Holmes, Director Bush, Director Vasilaki, Director Sentis, Director Robinson, Director Bauer, Director Pendergraft, Director Johansson, Director Spencer Coyne, Director Roberts, Director Knodal, Director Kozakovich, and have I missed anybody? 
please wave madly if I did. Okay, I didn't write that down. I know Ms. Malden's recording. They did, uh, I think the motion failed. Yeah, that's 13 opposed, so the motion fails. Okay, thank you very much, directors. We're still under director's motions right now. Did anybody have a notice of motion to bring forward today? Director Roberts, your hand is up. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you to the chair. I'd like to make a notice of motion to, re <clears throat> to review the chipping program um, objectives and funding model um, as decisions we have made uh, in, the, in the last budgeting process. And again, this would be for the following years, not for this year, um, has created consequences where um, all the budget was used up by February 18th and uh, or they're about within that week and uh, we have a long line of people still wishing to utilize that service so um, again it's more about what our objectives what our overall arching policy is for that and then the funding model whether or not it actually meets those objectives um, effectively fairly and equitably so that's um, my notice of motion is to review the chipping program objectives and funding model Okay, thank you. Ms. Malden, did you get that? I got it, Madam Chair. Oh, CAO Newell's got it. Thank you. So that's a notice of motion. We'll see that uh, brought back for the next meeting. Did anybody else have a notice of motion to present today? Okay, not seeing any there. Uh, we've got board members verbal updates next. And I just also want to remind everybody we do have a closed session after that, so don't disappear. Did anybody have an update to bring forward? Director Vasilaki, go ahead, please. Thank you very much. This is going to be a voluntary request I'm putting forward. Uh, as you, you all know, uh, the city of Penticton is having a little bit of a problem with Minister Eby uh, concerning homeless people um, and all those other things that are involved with this matter. But that's not what I'm going to be asking for the the, uh, the mayors of the regional district or um, the, the regional district itself to um, send a, a letter of support to the province Minister E.B. and the Premier concerning in the invoking of paramountcy uh, towards municipalities who make legal decisions uh, concerning their communities. And the, the province should not have the right to override what elected officials who are elected by their community to make decisions on their behalf uh, should be overwritten by the province or even the federal government. So what I'm uh, asking is so that the, the mayors, along with uh, the uh, uh, regional district, send a letter of support if they wish. It's voluntary. I'm not asking you to do it whether you want to or not, uh, to send it to the province, those, uh, and that's the, um, Minister Eby and the Premier. Uh, to support your right uh, for someone not to take those rights away from you and your community. Uh, and if you wish, you can CC me uh, if you wish to send a letter. I thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Director Vasilaki. I'm going to go to CAO. Is that um, something that we need to bring before the board then for a board decision if we're writing? I would say it'd probably be a good idea. Uh, Madam Chair, just because uh, it would be uh, something that the board should probably vote on. Uh, it's a fairly significant matter. Okay, so we could see that brought back for discussion at the next board meeting? Yeah, we'll put it on for next okay. uh, meeting. Right, so the request, uh, if I'm correct, <laughs> Director Vasilaki, is that we're writing on the issue of um, not having the province being able to override a decision of ours, you're not asking us to write specifically about what's happening with the city of Penticton, just to push the I, issue I, separate. Exactly, because if everybody okay. has a different view of homeless, um, and that's not what I'm asking for. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Any other director with a verbal update from their community? 
Okay, I am not seeing anyone. That takes us then, folks, to section H, which is closed session. So I am looking for a motion to go into closed in accordance with section 91E of the community charter, that the board close the meeting to the public on the basis of the acquisition, disposition, or expropriation of land or improvements if the council considers that disclosure could reasonably be expected to harm the interests of the municipality. Uh, Director Roberts, you're moving that, it looks like. And Director Obrick, you're seconding. Is that correct? Okay, thank you. We are in closed and just hang up, hang on while we can. Thanks, Dr. We have to kick some people out uh, who are in the 